Jennifer, good day. May I come in? Jennifer looked up from her papers and smiled. Hello, Lisa. Please, come in. What's happened today? Is your blood pressure acting up again? The elderly woman shook her head and took a seat. No, my blood pressure is fine. I've been taking the pills you prescribed every day, and they seem to help. So, what's the matter? Inquired the young woman. What's not right now? Well, I wanted to get an appointment with a gastroenterologist, but the registration desk wouldn't give me one. They said I can only do it through you, explained Lisa. So here I am. You're understanding. You'll give me a referral, won't you? Jennifer glanced at the elderly woman, but out of the corner of her eye, she saw her assistant nurse, Maggie, scrunching her face. Maggie was a stern individual. Deep down, Jennifer was glad she was the one in charge in their duo. If Maggie were the therapist, the patients wouldn't get any referrals or prescriptions that actually worked. Maggie followed all the rules so meticulously that all those elderly men and women who made up the majority of their patients would scatter to other practices in search of a more lenient doctor, or they'd resort to self-medication, and who knows what that could lead to. To see a gastroenterologist, Jennifer asked again, What's bothering you, Lisa? Please, tell me more. As far as I remember, you didn't complain about your stomach last time. The elderly woman began describing her symptoms, and the office door silently cracked open. In the doorway appeared David's smiling face. He winked at Jennifer, who frowned. Lisa also looked at the door and exclaimed joyfully, David, it's so good you're the one I ran into. The registration desk told me your shift starts after lunch. I decided to come to work a bit earlier, he said and I have an appointment with you. Lisa bragged. At 3.30, Jennifer scheduled it for me last week. My heart's been acting up a bit, so I thought I'd get some advice. David looked at Jennifer, and his smile grew wider. Lisa, you're in capable hands, he said. Jennifer is a godsend. You won't go wrong with her. The elderly woman nodded in agreement. That's exactly what I think, David, Lisa said. Every time I come here, I tell her that I should see Jennifer without you. Jennifer, who was thoroughly embarrassed by these compliments, interrupted the enthusiastic patient. David, why did you come? She asked. Do you have some business with me? No, not really. David replied, there's just a medical record in my office, and it seems to belong to a patient from your area. I thought I'd pass it on to you. The nurse reached out her hand, but David, as if ignoring her, handed the record to Jennifer. She smiled awkwardly. Thank you. The girl could almost physically feel Maggie's gaze on her. She sensed Maggie's eyes following the medical record avidly, like a predator catching scent of its prey. She could see Maggie struggling not to snatch the crucial piece of evidence from Jennifer's hands. David smiled at the girl once again, waved to Maggie, assured Lisa he would wait for her, and left the office. The elderly woman resumed her explanations. In the mornings, it's not so bad. But after breakfast, I suffer from heartburn, she mumbled. So, I thought it might be a good idea to get it checked out. Jennifer listened to her absent-mindedly, nodding for appearance's sake, while her mind wandered elsewhere. She was lost in daydreams that had nothing to do with reality. Maggie, please write a referral for Lisa, she said. The young woman hadn't quite grasped what Lisa was complaining about, but in her excitement, she was ready to grant her anything, and the referral to the gastroenterologist was the least Jennifer could do for her patient. Maggie, grumbling something under her breath, leaned over the form, and Jennifer seized the moment. She opened the medical record that David had brought and peeked under the cover. As expected, there was a message hidden inside. The record held a prescription form, on which the doctor's handwriting sprawled messily, barely legible. See you at lunch, with a heart symbol replacing the signature. What a childish game. As Jennifer closed the record, her eyes inadvertently fell on the engagement ring shining on her finger. Her smile vanished instantly. What had she been thinking? Why had she daydreamed about the impossible? She knew well that there was no future between her and David. I'm going on rounds, mumbled Maggie, as soon as the door closed behind the last patient. See you tomorrow. Goodbye, Jennifer mumbled. She knew very well that the nurse couldn't stand her although she didn't understand why. At least, their work wasn't affected by it, not for now. Maggie clicked her tongue, rolled her eyes, and listened to Jennifer talking to patients, but she never openly expressed her disapproval. 
at least not in words. Her glances seemed eloquent enough. They spoke volumes. The phone on Jennifer's desk rang, and she saw the word mom displayed on the screen. She sighed. The uncomfortable questioning was about to start again, as if something could change in her life in just two days. Hi, mom. Jennifer began with an artificially cheerful tone. You're practically psychic. Knew exactly when everyone would clear out. Well, I've learned your entire schedule. Courtney replied. I know everything's like clockwork for you. How are you? Anything new? Well, not much new, really. Jennifer muttered. Even the patients are the same old ones. Some of them have developed new ailments, but most of it is just psychosomatic, nothing serious. Of course, Courtney was not interested in that at all, but Jennifer didn't argue. She patiently listened to her mother's inquiries, and eventually, Courtney got to the point. How's Matthew doing? I haven't visited you guys in a while. I've been so busy. Maybe I'll drop by next week. Things should ease up at work, and I might get off earlier. This feigned politeness annoyed Jennifer. She knew perfectly well that her mother wouldn't visit them in a week, two weeks, or a month. Courtney only came on holidays and stayed for at most half an hour, then left, wiping away tears of pity and mumbling words of encouragement, as if someone benefited from them. On the contrary, after these visits, Matthew withdrew and wouldn't speak to his wife for hours. All this pretended sympathy was nothing but a burden. It would be better if her mother didn't remember them at all. Dealing with her husband was difficult enough as it was. How can Matthew be doing? Jennifer muttered. The same as before. He sits and stares out the window. You can never tell what he's thinking. Maybe he should find some hobby. Courtney suggested. At least solving Sudoku puzzles or doing jigsaw puzzles. People need something to occupy their minds, really. Sudoku, mom. Jennifer almost shouted. Jigsaw puzzles. He's in depression. Why would he need puzzles? The office door quietly cracked open. At first, the girl saw a massive bouquet of roses, and then David entered with his usual smile. However, that smile vanished the moment he saw the expression on her face. There must have been a torrent of emotions on her face that Jennifer was desperately trying to keep inside and not unleash on her mother. Thanks, Mom. Jennifer said, her voice restrained. I'll try to think of something, but for now, excuse me. I have someone here for a prescription. We'll talk later, okay? Goodbye. Jennifer hung up the phone and angrily pushed it aside. David sat across from her like a mischievous schoolboy and asked, Did your mom call? Yeah. Jennifer nodded. She's trying to find out about Matthew through me. She'd come and see for herself if she were really interested. I hate this pretense. How is Matthew? David asked. Jennifer glanced at him askance and sighed. David, please, don't even start, okay? How do you think he is? He sits at home and doesn't want anything. He's not living, and when I look at him, I feel like climbing the walls. She covered her face with her hands, but David gently potted her shoulder. Please, no tears, he requested. Jennifer, don't break my heart. Look at the beauty I brought. Flowers, your favorites. Jennifer removed her hands from her face and forced a smile. Roses, she murmured. I'm so cliche. You're the best, David assured her. Just like these flowers, simply beautiful. Except I'm not a very good person, Jennifer said. She took the roses, inhaled their scent, and closed her eyes. Thank you, David. I don't know what I would do without you. I can't even imagine. Maybe you'd just sit here alone and mope. David shrugged. You're a real crybaby, you know. Jennifer mockingly waved the bouquet at David, feigning outrage. Now I'll show you who's the crybaby here. The office door swung open. Jennifer lowered the bouquet and looked at the person who had entered with a sense of alarm. Maggie pretended not to notice the cardiologist comfortably settled on the couch, walked over to the table, muttering to herself, I forgot my cosmetics. And they brought flowers for Jennifer here. David cheerfully reported, See, Maggie, how much your patients appreciate your hard work. Of course, they do, the nurse mumbled. Bouquets every day. We're an elite clinic, after all, and our patients have a lot of money. Have a good day. I'm out of here. She left the room, and Jennifer looked at the man disapprovingly. Why did you say nonsense to her? It's obvious that Lisa wouldn't bring me flowers. Only the elderly come to me. The cardiologist shrugged awkwardly. What was I supposed to say? He muttered. 
Should I have confessed that I brought you the flowers? You shouldn't have brought them at all. Jennifer sighed. Anyway, it can't get any worse. Thanks for the bouquet, David. I really appreciate it. She placed the roses in a vase and admired them, while David watched her. What are you doing today? He asked. When? Jennifer wondered. My hospital hours are over. I'll be going on house calls now, and then, as usual, home. Maybe we can pretend that you have more house calls than usual today. The man suggested. What do you mean? Jennifer didn't understand. Can you take me as one of your patients? David proposed. There's a new restaurant near my place. I'd like to take you there if you don't mind. Jennifer hesitated. The cardiologist's offer sounded tempting. She hadn't been out in so long. However, something didn't feel right. I won't mind. Jennifer mumbled. But there's Matthew. What about Matthew? The man asked irritably. Matthew sees you every day. Hugs and kisses you. Can't I have dinner with you just once? He doesn't hug me. Jennifer nervously chuckled. We hardly talk. We live like neighbors, or like a patient and a caregiver. Matthew only allows Minier when he needs to set up the four. He's even learned to administer his own injections to avoid bothering me unnecessarily. Reflecting on this, Jennifer felt resentment welling up again. She was only 28 years old, yet she lived a more monotonous life than some retirees. One could even say she didn't live. She merely existed. She had dedicated herself entirely to her ailing husband, and Matthew didn't appreciate it one bit. He sulked and turned away from her as if she were to blame for the tragedy that had befallen him. How tired she was of all this. Just two hours. The cardiologist urged her, let's sit for a while, and then I'll personally drive you home. Okay, Jennifer decided. I think I deserve a little break. Anyway, Matthew won't even look at me. He probably won't even notice if I'm home or not. I'll tell him Lisa had a heart issue and unexpectedly called me over. It's not her heart that had an issue. It's mine. David sighed. You wounded me, dear. He kissed Jennifer on the cheek and left the office. Jennifer sat there with her face in her hands for a while. She was utterly confused. She didn't know what to do next Matthew, David. Her husband's illness, which wasn't getting better over time and, if anything, was deteriorating, would likely last for years. Jennifer understood that she couldn't endure this for much longer. One fine day, she would burst and tell Matthew about her feelings. Would she be happier afterward? It was uncertain, but she would certainly lose her self-respect. Her contemplations were interrupted by her phone's demanding ringtone. A bookshop she had last visited three years ago, when she was still a living person and not a pale shadow of herself, sent her an invitation to their next sale. Jennifer deleted it, changed her clothes, and headed towards the door. It was time for her rounds. At least her work saved her in some way. Without it, she would have lost her mind a long time ago. Talking to patients, in a way, helped her distract herself. Most of them were respectable elderly women, like Lisa while some simply invented illnesses to gain attention from their surroundings. However, the awareness that there were people worse off than her provided Jennifer with a little solace. She reminded herself to stay strong and not complain. If she gave up, what could she expect from Matthew, who had long since lost hope? After visiting her last patient, Jennifer left the house and stared at her phone in contemplation. She needed to call Matthew and let him know she would be late, but how she didn't want to do it. She even less wanted to lie to her husband. It felt like a sin, akin to deceiving a saint. Jennifer sighed and found a familiar number in her contacts. Once upon a time, Matthew's name had occupied the top spot in her contact list as the person she called most often. Now, however, that place was taken by her mother. She communicated with David at work and Matthew. The spouses had become people with nothing to say to each other. Yet once, they had sworn eternal love to each other. Hello, Matthew's voice sounded hoarse, as if from someone who didn't often open his mouth and utter words. How are you, Matthew? Jennifer asked, only realizing how silly the question sounded a bit too late. How am I, you're asking? He retorted, oh, just splendid. Absolutely fantastic. I met up with friends early in the morning. They were thrilled to see me. I had a kickabout with the guys at the old football stadium. Afterward, we headed to a bar, had a pint of beer each. You know, the kind with a nice frothy head. Not like the ones you get at the store. And then, 
Jennifer sighed heavily and interrupted him. Matthew, I'm asking seriously. And what answer were you expecting? He wondered, did you genuinely want to hear about how my day went? All right, let it be your way. Around nine o'clock, I positioned myself by the window and started counting pedestrians. When 230 women and 198 men passed by our house, I got tired of that activity and found other ways to entertain myself. I started counting cars. You know, the most common color for cars in our city is gray. I didn't include the ones covered in mud in that count. Jennifer patiently listened to her husband, never once interrupting him. It seemed like Matthew found a twisted pleasure in discussing his misery. Do you want me to bring you something from the store? She asked when he finally ran out of steam. Bring something. He grumbled grumpily. Remember where they sell new spines? Jennifer fell silent. I don't need anything, Jennifer. He continued. I'm not a child to be delighted with a lollipop. All right, I'll pick something myself. Jennifer said wearily. And one more thing, Matthew. I'll be late today. Lisa called. Remember I told you about her. I'll drop by and check on her. I understand. Her husband replied curtly. All right, have a good time over there. Thanks. Jennifer automatically replied and then perked up. Wait a minute. What do you mean? Have a good time. What are you implying? The only response to Jennifer was the prolonged beeping of the phone. Matthew hung up, cutting the conversation short. Jennifer stood there, staring at her phone in disbelief. She didn't even notice the car that had pulled up next to her. Hey there, sorry I'm late. Anything happen? Jennifer shook her head and forced herself to smile. No, nothing. She muttered, don't pay any attention. It's just me. These patients, right? David winked at her, but let's not talk about them anymore. While we're young and healthy, we should enjoy life and get its various bonuses. How about some Thai chicken? They say it's authentic in this restaurant just like in Thailand. Jennifer thought to herself, I've got a complicated patient too, and I'll have to live with this patient for the rest of my life. I wonder how I'll endure it. Oh, these patients. David continued, right, but let's not talk about them anymore. While we're young and healthy, we should enjoy life and reap its various rewards. How about some Thai chicken? They say it's authentic in this restaurant, just like in Thailand. Jennifer's thoughts drifted as she considered the complexities of her situation. I've got a complicated patient too, and I'll have to live with this patient for the rest of my life. I wonder how I'll endure it. Jennifer listened to him half-heartedly, nodding along. The idea of going to the restaurant didn't seem as appealing to her anymore. Matthew's last words still echoed in her ears. Have a good time. What did he mean by that? Did he find out about David? But how? Jennifer glanced at David for a moment and found a photo of another person in her phone, her husband. Over the past couple of years, she hadn't taken a single photo. It hurt too much to see how much Matthew had changed, almost beyond recognition. Jennifer only had old pictures. There they were, on their honeymoon at a tourist camp, posing against the backdrop of a river. Both of them had such happy faces, like children on holiday. And then, they went out with friends into the great outdoors, and Matthew fell asleep during a picnic. Jennifer didn't wake him. She just took a picture. At that moment, his face seemed exceptionally endearing. But, memories, like the photos, kept flooding in. Unexpectedly, Jennifer realized that tears were welling up in her eyes. You know, David, she slowly began. I probably won't be able to go to the restaurant today. Did something happen? David asked in surprise. Did I say something wrong? It's not about you. Jennifer sighed. I just have a headache, and I'm very tired today. Let's have dinner some other time. All right. As you wish. David nodded, continuing to gaze at Jennifer as if trying to decipher some hidden meaning in her words. Shall I take you home? Yes, please, Jennifer whispered. They completed the rest of the journey in silence. Conflicting emotions tore at Jennifer. She regretted not going to the restaurant. The opportunity to escape from home was so rare. She also worried that she had ruined David's evening, and she feared the impending meeting with Matthew. During their phone call, her husband had acted so strangely. What would he say to her when they met? As usual, David parked the car at a distance from Jennifer's home, just in case her husband was by the window. Shall I message you later today? David asked, his tone questioning. All right. Why? 
Jennifer didn't understand. To check on how you're feeling, the man explained. Don't take it the wrong way, but you really do look unwell. Jennifer forced a stiff smile. Don't talk nonsense, David, she said. Maybe you've forgotten, but I'm a doctor myself. I can take care of myself. I'll have dinner and go to bed early. I'll wake up as good as new in the morning. Take care of yourself. The man wished her, and Jennifer left the car behind. As she walked toward her entrance, Jennifer continued to feel David's gaze on her, struggling to resist the urge to quicken her pace. Even though she knew that her husband couldn't possibly see the cardiologist, having these two in such close proximity still unnerved Jennifer. She only felt relief when the door to the entrance closed behind her. Although, the term relief didn't really apply here. Instead, Jennifer began to worry about another matter. Her meeting with her husband was drawing closer, and she had no idea what to say to him. Jennifer tried to open the door as quietly as possible and entered the apartment silently. Sometimes, Matthew was asleep at this time, and she didn't want to wake him. However, after the tragedy that had happened to him, her husband could sleep at any time, as he put it, because he had nothing better to do. At least his dreams could be somewhat interesting. Jennifer's hopes were dashed. Matthew was not asleep. Moreover, he was talking to someone. Had he decided to reconnect with an old friend, or was he having a conversation with himself? What if he had gone even further than that? Quietly, she took off her shoes and walked into the room. Matthew was sitting in the kitchen, in front of a boiling kettle, and he hadn't noticed her presence. However, Jennifer could hear every word clearly. I've had enough of it all. Matthew muttered, staring thoughtfully out the window. Life is like this. Well, not really life at all. Jennifer is cheating on me. Hearing these words, Jennifer leaned weakly against the door frame. That was it. It seemed that Matthew really knew everything about David, and it didn't matter how he found out. The main thing was that pretending that nothing special was happening was no longer an option, and her husband continued to speak, causing Jennifer to shudder at his words. So, Matt, is it settled? Matthew asked, pressing the phone to his ear. Will you do it as I asked? This is the last time, I promise. Bring me the gun, and you are free. It's time to finish her. Finish her. Jennifer trembled with horror and retreated into the hallway. Could it be that her husband, her Matthew, whom she had known for nearly 10 years, had decided to commit murder? It was impossible to believe. Although, Jennifer was the one who betrayed him first, and as they say, a scorned person is capable of anything. They met when Jennifer was in her second year of medical school. The session had just ended, and her friend Elle's birthday was approaching. There were plenty of reasons to celebrate. The only thing casting a shadow over the girl's mood was the city itself. All their friends and acquaintances had dispersed. Some were already vacationing in the south of France. Alexandra has been sunbathing in Monaco for a week, the girl remarked in a mournful tone, scrolling through photos on social media. Look how and she's gotten, a real chocolate bar. Sunbathing too much is harmful, Jennifer declared in a didactic tone. Deep down, she envied Alexandra herself. Tanning is just a sunburn, that's all. Remember our high school biology class? You say that like a doctor, Elle retorted sourly, and you haven't even started working yet, haven't received your diploma. I can already imagine what a killjoy you'll become after a few years of working in a hospital. Jennifer didn't offer any objections to the killjoy remark, and Elle continued to observe other people's happiness. And James went to Elbrus, she said, pointing at the screen. Wow, I wonder where he's getting internet up in the mountains. Could there really be a signal? Maybe it's all photoshopped. He pasted his head onto someone else's body and is showing off. Don't tell me you're jealous of him. Jennifer laughed. Remember, back in 10th grade, when we went to the woods with the teacher, we were doing some biology project or something. You complained the whole way. You moaned about mosquitoes, dust, and the heat the entire time. Can you imagine how much worse it is for James now? A hundred times worse than what you experienced. He has no one up in the mountains, no taxes to take him home at any moment. But he's still living, not just existing, her friend retorted. He'll have something to remember when everyone returns to the city in the fall. And all we'll have to talk about is how many likes we got on other people's photos. Jennifer had nothing to reply to that. 
her feeble suggestions, like going to the beach or to the movies, were met with Elle's sarcasm. Elle considered all of that unserious. Besides, Jennifer didn't have much money. Courtney, her mother, raised her on her own, working as a schoolteacher, and they didn't have much to spare. Jennifer used her tiny scholarship to buy medical textbooks. There was no room for seaside trips. Elle continued to surf the internet for a while, but then her gaze suddenly lit up. Look here, she exclaimed. Jennifer peeked over her shoulder. Her friend had landed on a website for a tourist camp located not far from the city. Taking advantage of Jennifer's attention, Elle enthusiastically read aloud. If you're tired of the hustle and bustle of the city and want to enjoy the peace and freshness of nature, this tourist camp is the perfect place for your vacation. Look at those charming cottages they have in the beach. Check this out. Photos from the dance floor. They even have disco nights. And all that while it says above about peace and quiet. Jennifer muttered. Elle frowned. Just tell me, are you in or out? Will you come with me? To the tourist camp? Well, that's probably expensive. Jennifer muttered. Not more expensive than your smart books. Elle replied. Let's go for a couple of days. Take some photos. Dance a little, so we have something to remember, you know. Jennifer continued to hesitate, mentally counting how much money she had left until the next scholarship payment. Elle added, come on, please, let's go there for my birthday, and you don't have to give me a gift, deal. What nonsense, Jennifer protested. You're making me out to be some kind of miser, fine, let's go, and I promise you a gift. Aren't we friends? Elle squealed with joy and hugged her friend tightly. Of course, we're friends. The best friends. That's why let's go to the store right away and pick out swimsuits. For just two days. Jennifer sighed. Elle winked at her. Yes. So hurry up and get ready. Into the bus stop. In the end, they spent more time shopping than they had planned for their vacation. After buying swimsuits, Elle remembered to get tanning lotion and sunglasses. Then new dresses. Jennifer could only marvel at the frenzy. It's like you're preparing for a wedding. Not a vacation, she said in amazement. It doesn't hurt to be prepared, Elle replied. Maybe I'll meet my destiny right there, surrounded by nature. Why not? That's how it happens in movies. The countryside atmosphere sets the mood. Deep down, Jennifer was glad she didn't have such plans herself. She was going to the tourist camp for exactly what was mentioned on the website piece. Tranquility, the sound of waves, and the smell of trees in the morning. She had never considered herself a heartbreaker, and guys had always treated her with restraint. In her school years, she was even considered a bookworm. It was Elle with her vibrant appearance and fashionable dresses who could expect male attention. Jennifer was content with simple pastimes like badminton on the sports field and orderly routines. She didn't worry about it at all. The friends arrived at the tourist camp early in the morning, just as the sun was rising above the houses. Jennifer yuned endlessly throughout the journey, while Elle remained lively and chatty like a little bird. You're unusually energetic. Jennifer exclaimed as the taxi disappeared into the distance. You're usually not awake before noon. Two cups of coffee work wonders, Elle replied. Okay, enough chatting. Let's go find out who's in charge here. They passed through the gates and went in search of the administration. Here, the girl's joyful expectations collided with harsh reality. The director was not at his post, he had gone fishing since the night. The administrator seems to have disappeared somewhere, Elle whispered to her friend. And a stern cleaning lady, with a mop in hand, bluntly stated, Check-in at our camp starts at noon, you've arrived too early. So, are we supposed to go back home? Elle asked irritably. Why go back home right away? The old woman replied, You can sit here at the entrance or over there in the gazebo. There aren't many vacationers here right now and the ones who are here are all asleep. You can't say enough about the top-notch service, Elle commented sarcastically as the cleaning lady disappeared into one of the cottages. You know, I think I'll start writing a review about this place. There's nothing else to do, and I'll enjoy the rest, Jennifer said. I'll consider these hours we spend here for free as a bonus. You have to look for the positive side in everything. Didn't you teach me that? Elle frowned at first, but then burst into laughter. And this is the case where the student has surpassed the teacher. She said, you're right, Jennifer. I got too carried away. 
Besides, it's not certain that we'll waste this time. I think I already see a goal. What goal? What are you talking about? Jennifer didn't understand at first but then saw who her friend was referring to. Whom she was talking about, not what. Because Elle had little interest in the wonders of nature. Two guys in shorts were walking along the alley from the beach. When Elle saw them, she almost fell off the bench. Just look at them. She whispered fervently to her friend. Don't make up nonsense, Jennifer muttered. Guys are just guys, nothing special. What do you mean nothing special, Elle exclaimed. Take a good look at those muscles. Let's make a deal right away which one are you choosing? The one on the right or the left? Not it, he's mine. You know I like the fair-haired ones. The second one is a redhead, so he suits you too. Her friend waved her off. Take them both. Judging by Elle's expression, she had clearly hatched some plan, and Jennifer didn't like it one bit. She didn't mind if her friend got involved in some intrigue, but she had absolutely no desire to participate in it herself. Jennifer had come here to relax after her exams, and adventures with random guys were the last thing on her mind. Elle squinted her eyes and patiently, like a cat on the prowl, observed the guys. She waited until they came level with the bench and called out, How's the water today? Is it safe for swimming? Or should we wait until July? The guys looked at them and broke into smiles. Up close, Jennifer didn't find them to be the heartthrobs Elle had made them out to be. Yes, they were muscular, no doubt about it. They must have been regulars at the gym. But, as Jennifer's mother Courtney would say, they weren't lacking in intelligence. The water is as warm as milk, reassured the blonde. The redhead nodded in agreement, his mouth seemingly sealed shut as if his teeth were glued together with gum. His gaze made Jennifer uncomfortable. I hope he doesn't take a liking to me, she thought, or these two days will turn into torment. It will be all about constantly looking around and hiding from this guy in the bushes. And have you just arrived here? The blonde inquired. I haven't seen such beautiful ladies around before. We just got here today, Elle smiled, and this is how they welcomed us, making us sit here with our suitcases. They won't let you check in early. The guy clarified. So, what's the problem? Come over to our place for now. Let's get to know each other. Have a drink to celebrate. At the mention of having a drink, Jennifer shivered apprehensively, and the stranger immediately reassured her. T, ladies, T, let's have your suitcases. We'll introduce you to our group. The mention of a group didn't excite Elle. She had clearly expected that the guys would be alone at the campsite. Jennifer was simply amazed by such naivety. Could such Adonises, as her friend put it, possibly be alone here? The place Elle was aiming for was probably already occupied. It seemed her friend was in for a profound disappointment. However, Elle, even if she sensed the futility of her intentions, had no intention of giving up. She smiled at the guys and introduced herself. I'm Elle. What are your names? I'm Paul, the blonde said and pointed to his friend. And this is Cole. The redhead nodded again never taking his eyes off Jennifer. Feeling out of her element, Jennifer introduced herself as well. And what's he staring at? Jennifer thought, could it be that I'm wrong and these two are here alone? Are there no other girls? The guys led them to their cabin. Ellen Paul walked ahead, while Cole volunteered to carry Jennifer's suitcase and walked beside her. Much to Jennifer's chagrin, he finally found his voice. Want me to tell you a secret? Cole asked in a conspiratorial tone. No, Jennifer almost replied curtly, but that would have been impolite, so she forced herself to smile. Go ahead. You are pretty, Cole stated as if he were revealing some profound truth. If Elle had been in her shoes, she would probably have responded with something like, I know. But Jennifer wasn't well versed in such conversations, so she simply thanked her new acquaintance. Thank you. Near the cabin where the guys were staying, there was a barbecue grill. On the table in the gazebo, a row of bottles stood in a clear sign that the evening had been lively. Mentally calculating the amount of alcohol consumed, Jennifer concluded that there must be at least five more people in Paul and Cole's company. Otherwise, the guys couldn't possibly be standing after such a drinking session. A red-haired girl was bustling around the table. Just one look at her, and Jennifer knew she was Cole's sister. They looked like twins. Who's up for breakfast? The redhead asked, waving a knife. I've made sandwiches. Make some more, Cole ordered, looking at the table. 
We have guests. And who are you? The redhead asked, looking at the girls. Two more hunters after our playboys. Look at how popular they are. I deliberately brought them into nature to get a break from female attention, and here you are. Hearing this assumption, Elle wrinkled her nose disdainfully. Like we do that, she exclaimed. We won't chase after the guys. Let them chase after us, right, Jennifer? That's right, agreed the redhead. They are not worth it. At least my brother isn't. What's that supposed to mean? Protested Cole. The redhead handed him the knife. If you want to treat our guests, make the sandwiches yourself, she declared. I've had enough for today. You guys have already been swimming today, but I haven't. I'm going to the beach. I'd rather swim too, Jennifer quickly said, eager to get away from Cole. Then let's all go together, Elle said. You guys will show us the local sights, won't you? Difficult. For us. Paul exclaimed. You ladies must be mistaking us for someone else. Of course, we'll show you. As they walked to the beach, Elf fell back a bit from the guys and whispered to her friend. Why are you so sour? You are spoiling the whole holiday for us. Am I spoiling it? Jennifer asked in surprise and sighed. You know, Elf, if I'm honest, I don't really like all this. I came here to relax, not to get involved in these romantic games. Especially since Cole, the guy you're trying to set me up with, seems as dumb as a rock. Do you like Paul then? Her friend asked seriously. Jennifer almost burst out laughing at such a suggestion. Oh, dear God, of course not, she said. Neither Cole nor Paul nor any other muscle head. If one happens to show up here, I just need peace, you understand. I've already had all my nerves stretched during the exams and now this. You don't even know what you want. Her friend scolded her. First, you're tired of studying, and then you say people lack intelligence. Figure out why you came here in the first place, to relax, right? They arrived at the beach, changed into their swimsuits, and Elle immediately dragged everyone into the water. Are you coming? Cole asked Jennifer right away. Although the girls really wanted to swim, Jennifer shook her head. The wind feels strangely cold today, she said. You guys go without me. The redhead hesitated, clearly intending to perform a heroic act and stay with Jennifer on the shore, but his sister dragged him into the water to swim. It was evident that this girl was fervently guarding her brother from any random acquaintances. Did their parents give her such a task, or was it a habit she had developed over the years as the older sister? Whatever the case, Jennifer was grateful to her for the temporary reprieve. At least for half an hour, she was spared from persistent courtship, and that was something. With nothing else to do, Jennifer started collecting seashells along the beach. She didn't know why she was doing it. Perhaps it was also a long-standing habit. In her childhood, she always engaged in searches when she came to the beach collecting beautiful stones, seashells, and various interesting plants. There weren't many people on the beach, but there was a lifeguard's chair. Sitting in it was a guy who appeared to be around 25 years old, no older, working on a crossword puzzle. He was so engrossed in his activity that he didn't even notice Jennifer approaching, and his contemplative expression amused her. The lifeguard was chewing on the pen, a habit that Jennifer couldn't stand. However, he seemed so absorbed, as if he were solving a major test. Unlike Cole's shallow compliments, all of this seemed close to Jennifer's heart, and she also glanced at the crossword puzzle. Word number 15 vertically is consensus, Jennifer said, and 20 is resection. The lifeguard was taken aback, raised his head, and looked at the girl. What's that? Resection. What do you eat it with? He asked in puzzlement. You're better off not knowing. Jennifer assured him. Tell me, where did you get this crossword puzzle? Was it made for academics or something? The lifeguard shrugged. Probably a higher level of difficulty. I deliberately chose one like this, but I didn't think it would be impossible to solve without an encyclopedia. Jennifer couldn't help but feel respect for him. She wasn't particularly fond of crossword puzzles herself, but people who chose more challenging puzzles, in her opinion, were a cut above the rest. Are you an academic? The guy smiled. I'm just a student, Jennifer said shyly, explaining. I'm in my second year of medical school. If everything goes well, I'll become a doctor. The lifeguard got up from his chair and pointed to the table. Well then, sit down. Let's solve it together. War. Jennifer asked in surprise. 
The guy pointed to the magazine cover. Do you see what's written here? The winner gets a blender. I don't really need it. But the main thing is to win, right? And if we're lucky, you can keep the blender. Jennifer wanted to say that she didn't need a blender either. She had one at home. However, something in the guy's shining eyes prevented her from declining. Okay, she nodded. I'll help in any way I can. Jennifer never thought that solving crosswords could be so much fun. She argued with the stranger, picking out words, laughing, and perhaps for the first time in her life, she didn't hesitate to engage in a debate with a male. Jennifer was so engrossed in this activity that she completely forgot about the time, and to be honest, about L2. L had been observing her friend for some time and finally approached her. Hello, L greeted the guy with a fake smile. What are you doing here? We're solving a crossword, Jennifer replied, though it seemed quite obvious. Her mood suddenly took a nosedive. She had no doubt that L was about to say something rude. What an interesting beach activity, her friend continued. It's a pity to interrupt you, but we need to have lunch. The lifeguard glanced at his watch and nodded. Well, I completely lost track of time. I'm sorry. And apparently, your job too, L sarcastically added. You were so engrossed in your crossword that you forgot about everything else. Ten people could have drowned, and you wouldn't have noticed. Complaints should be filed against such workers, I'll tell you that. Jennifer was ready to melt from embarrassment for her friend. Please accept our apologies, she muttered. Unable to look at the lifeguard, we'll probably go now, but we'll definitely finish the crossword later. I promise. As Jennifer uttered these words, she couldn't even imagine herself approaching the lifeguard again. After what Elle had said to him, Jennifer felt ashamed to return to the beach, let alone address that guy. He must have understood her feelings, as he waved it off. It's okay, I can manage. The girls left for the changing room, and there Jennifer let her emotions flow. Why did you do that to him, L? She asked. I've never noticed you being rude before, so why now? Why? Because I wanted to help you, L casually replied. And why are you so upset? Why did you do that to him? Jennifer mocked her friend. Do you want to say that you liked him? Maybe you wanted to ask, why are you so into me? I didn't like him. Jennifer pouted. It's just not right to treat people like that. It's not nice. So, you definitely liked him, Elle concluded, glancing out of the changing room, looking in the lifeguard's direction, and reluctantly admitted, maybe you're right. There's something about him, muscles and all. I don't care about muscles, Jennifer grumbled. And what else do you need for happiness? Elle smirked. Oh yes, I forgot. High intellect. Well, judging by how enthusiastically this guy is into crosswords, He's got that in spades. Intellect can be high, not big. Jennifer mumbled. However, her friend paid no attention to this remark. But the most important thing is not that, Elle remarked in a didactic tone. It's not about brains or muscles. If a guy has no money at all, tell me, what's the use of him? Even if he looks like Brad Pitt. Is your Paul very wealthy then? Jennifer inquired. Well, first of all, he's not mine yet. Elle reluctantly admitted, and secondly, I found out a few things. He works at an auto repair shop, and he makes a pretty decent income. At least, he's not destitute. That's for sure. But this crossword-solving brunette, he's just a regular lifeguard. What kind of job is that for a man? Sitting on the beach, probably earning very little. Enough already. Jennifer interrupted her. You've probably got a millionaire waiting for you over there at the auto shop. Perhaps, Elle agreed but you should still take a closer look at Cole. His sister may be quite snobbish, but I did some digging about him too. Cole's parents have a small company in town. It seems pretty good. What do you say? Jennifer didn't want to say anything on the subject and left the changing room. Just the thought of Paul's red-haired body made her head ache. Why had her mother raised her to be so proper? If she were as bold as Elle, she would have expressed all her thoughts about the persistent suitor. The lifeguard was no longer on the beach, probably also gan for lunch. However, Elle's new friends were right there with them. Wearing bright shirts and pants, typical vacationers, they quickly approached the girls. May I have your pen? Paul gallantly asked Elle. The restaurant is waiting for us. Cole just grunted. Shall we go? Jennifer nodded. She had a feeling that the red-haired girl, whose name they still hadn't learned, was watching this performance with displeasure. 
She probably thought that Jennifer was overjoyed to have snagged her brother. Save me. Jennifer silently appealed to the red-haired stranger. She only snorted and turned away. Great. It seemed that Jennifer was to blame for everything herself. Cole, looking at Jennifer, remarked, I think I've seen you somewhere. Really? Jennifer asked, just to avoid appearing selfish. You must be mistaken. I would remember such a meeting. No, I'm sure. Cole insisted, at the museum. You look like that. What's her name? Mona Lisa. On who? Jennifer burst into laughter. She found it amusing not only that Cole was talking about museums, which he probably had never visited, but also the comparison he made. Jennifer had absolutely nothing in common with the Mona Lisa, except for their gender, perhaps. And so what? I'm telling you, it's true. Cole remained undaunted, spitting image. Jennifer had a hard time waiting for lunch to be over, and later, citing sunburn, she went inside the house, all wrinkled her nose disdainfully, wished her a happy rest, and left with her new friends. It seemed she considered her friend a lost cause. Meanwhile, Jennifer finally relaxed and was able to rest just the way she wanted. She lay down for a while, listening to the birds singing, and gradually drifted off to sleep. When she woke up, it was already getting dark outside. She felt hungry, but she was afraid to go to the dining hall. There, she might encounter a lively crowd. Munching on some cookies she had brought with her, Jennifer decided to take a short walk. It was a shame to oversleep the brief vacation in such a beautiful place. Passing by Paul and Cole's cabin, she headed for the beach. There were no people here anymore, and the evening was indeed cool. Shivering in the wind, Jennifer walked along the shore and then started to head back. The sunset was beautiful and Jennifer's mood was good, nothing seemed to darken her soul. However, soon she would face an unpleasant encounter. Jennifer was about to leave the beach when she ran into Cole. He was clearly in high spirits, and just one look at his wide grin made Jennifer's heart sink. Hi, he said. I was looking for you, believe it or not. I almost knocked down the door to your cabin. I thought you were fast asleep, and here you are, taking a stroll. Isn't it boring being alone? Jennifer shook her head. No, I'm an introvert, so I never get bored by myself. Everything's fine. Who? Cole asked in confusion and, without waiting for an answer, said, Well, it's a good thing I found you. The disco starts in five minutes. Let's hurry. And where are Ellen and Paul? Jennifer asked in a frightened tone. They're already there, so shall we? Let's go faster. Sorry, but I don't want to dance, she said coldly. So, go to the disco without me. It'll be better. For whom will it be better? For me. Cole didn't understand and squinted angrily. So, I have to waste my time again. Start from scratch. Did my efforts go to waste? But I didn't ask you to do this. Jennifer said, frightened and stepped back. I think you misunderstood me. No, I understood you perfectly. The guy replied. Stop playing with my head. Let's go the easy way before it gets tough. Jennifer took a few steps back, seriously considering the option of fleeing. What kept her from running too far was the realization that she probably wouldn't get very far. Athletic achievements were never among Jennifer's accomplishments. I think the lady made it clear that she doesn't want to go with you. Leave her alone. A voice that Jennifer recognized as the lifeguard she had met earlier spoke up, even though she had only heard it once in her life. She turned and saw him approaching. He was wearing just shorts, water dripping from his head and shoulders. Apparently, the commotion happening on the beach had distracted him from his swim. And who are you? Cole asked challengingly, shifting his attention to the newcomer. Why are you interfering? Let the girl go. The lifeguard repeated. My girl can go wherever I want her to. Cole retorted. Since when am I your girl? Jennifer protested. I saw you for the first time this morning. So what? The scoundrel sneered. Do I have to chase after you for a year? Who are you anyway? Before Jennifer could respond, the lifeguard intervened. He circled around her and forcefully shoved Cole in the chest. Get out of here. Don't even think about getting close to this girl, understand? And if I don't? Cole asked. In response, the lifeguard punched him in the face. Cole couldn't keep his footing and fell onto the sand. Jennifer gasped in fear. I didn't intend to. The lifeguard replied, taking his eyes off the now angered Cole. I just wanted this guy to stop insulting you. Cole struggled to his feet. The merriment vanished from his face. 
He was no longer smiling. He lunged at the lifeguard, but the lifeguard used some clever footwork to send him sprawling to the ground. Please stop, Jennifer said almost in tears. You're right, the lifeguard nodded. Fighting with this guy is just getting dirty, let's go from here. Cole thrashed around in the sand, cursing loudly. Perhaps the alcohol had severely clouded his judgment, as getting up for a second round seemed beyond his capability. I'll find you, got it. He shouted after the lifeguard. You'll regret ever being born. Jennifer couldn't make out his further words. It seemed like her tormentor was choking on sand and desperately spitting it out. Apparently, Jennifer looked too terrified because the lifeguard inquired, Are you okay? No dizziness or blackouts. I'm fine, thanks. Jennifer replied, Is it really that obvious that I'm about to faint? You turned pale, the guy noted. It was just all so unexpected. Jennifer explained, My vacation in this place turned out to be nothing like I planned. Honestly, I was dreaming of peace and quiet, but my friend can't live without adventures. So, I stumbled into this mess along with her. The guy nodded. I have friends like that too. I totally get what you're saying. He picked up a t-shirt and shorts from the table and started getting dressed. The young people glanced in Cole's direction, who was still struggling in the sand. His appearance filled Jennifer with fear mixed with disgust. Thanks for your help. She thanked the guy. It's my job. He smiled. I'm a lifeguard, remember? Of course, Jennifer replied but I thought your working hours were over a long time ago. In fact, from the moment I came down to the beach, it seemed like there was nobody here. Where did you come from? I was swimming, he replied, but there was no one in the water either. Jennifer objected. I checked. I was far away, on the other side, Cole replied. I swim there every evening for training. Jennifer looked in amazement at the opposite shore. Swimming there was quite a distance. She wouldn't risk it even with a life jacket. Well, she muttered, it seems like they take staff selection very seriously at this tourist base. Well, I don't actually work here, the guy replied. I'm just filling in for a friend. His wife just gave birth, and they're celebrating. I volunteered to work for Matt. It's a big event. Let the guy spend some time with his family. He paused for a moment and added, although after today, Matt might have some questions from his superiors if this guy complains. Cole. Maybe he won't remember anything in the morning. Jennifer said hopefully. He'll go to his friends, have a drink, and forget about it completely. The mirror will remind him, the lifeguard remarked. He'll definitely have a black eye. Well, what will be, will be. Maybe you should at least tell me your name so that Matt knows who suffered for him. Jennifer smiled shyly. Po Matt, she muttered. My name is Jennifer. You'll remember that for sure. I'm Matthew. Nice to meet you. So, Jennifer, where can I escort you? I'll make sure no one bothers you anymore. To this simple, seemingly innocent question, the girl had no answer. After what happened on the beach, she was afraid to walk alone, and returning to the cottage was not appealing either. She had just left it. Besides, Jennifer was afraid that L, upon her return, would blame her for ruining their vacation, saying that Jennifer had shattered their newly formed group. She had rejected a potential suitor whom her friend had carefully chosen for her. Jennifer had neither the desire nor the strength to listen to these moral lessons. It seemed that Matthew understood everything from her expression because he asked, Would you like some tea? In the first moment, Jennifer was surprised by the straightforward offer, but then she realized that tea was precisely what she wanted, not alcohol, which Cole would undoubtedly offer her, not dancing and loud music which Jennifer couldn't stand. Just tea. The simplest kind, from a tea bag, like the one they used to get in the college cafeteria. That would be great, she nodded. Then let's go to my cabin, Matthew suggested and hastily added. Don't get any wrong ideas, though, I'm just inviting you as friends. I didn't think anything like that at all, Jennifer assured him, and that was the truth. Matthew's friendly, open expression completely put her at ease. Expecting any malicious intent from this person was simply impossible. They approached the service cabin, which was much more modest than those intended for vacationers. It reminded Jennifer of the small trailer that used to be at her grandmother's summer house during her childhood. I'll wait here, the girl said. Change your clothes, you're all wet. Matthew glanced at himself and nodded. He disappeared behind the door, and Jennifer shook her head. 
It seemed that despite his muscles, dangerous job, and swims across the river, her new acquaintance remained a child at heart. This made Jennifer even more comfortable. She herself, despite her serious plans in life, anatomy lectures, and conversations with famous professors, didn't consider herself a mature person. She still kept her old dolls in the closet that her mother had tried to throw away several times. In the lifeguard's cabin, it was surprisingly clean and cozy. Furniture-wise, there was a bed, a small cupboard, a table, and a chair with an inventory number on the back. Matthew put on the kettle and took out a bag of marshmallows from the cupboard. There are also some pastries from the buffet and cookies. He added with apparent awkwardness, I'm sorry, the table isn't very lavish. I invited you over, and I. This is the best table anyone has ever set for me. Jennifer sincerely reassured him. Thank you. The girl had skipped dinner and was starving. The treat offered by the lifeguard Jennifer seemed like a feast to her. Soon, she forgot about the incident that happened on the beach and was genuinely enjoying herself. It felt like she had known Matthew her whole life. Tell me, have you ever saved a drowning person? The girl asked with interest. Have you truly performed any heroic acts in the water, or were you just solving crossword puzzles? It sounds like you're challenging me. Matthew pretended to be offended. How about you lure someone into the river, and I'll save that po soul. It's getting late, and many people have probably had a few drinks. Someone might mistake you for a mermaid and follow you into the swamp. I'm serious. Jennifer insisted. Have you ever saved anyone, and how did it happen? It was tough, Matthew admitted because the drowning person was about 20 kilograms heavier than me and had no intention of being rescued. What do you mean? Jennifer didn't understand. Well, the drowning person, or rather, the unsuccessful drowning person, because it ended well, Matthew corrected himself, was my uncle. About 10 years ago, when I was still in school, he took me on a night fishing trip. Besides the two of us, there was his work buddy Uncle Eddie, a dog, and a bottle of vodka. I wasn't particularly interested in fishing, and neither was my uncle or his friend. While I was messing around with the dog, they were drinking vodka. Then, around midnight, those two decided to have a contest to see who could swim to the other shore. The river in those pots was even wider than here, but luckily, Eddie didn't even make it to the water, he collapsed on the shore and fell asleep. But my uncle was pretending to be a hero, trying to prove something to me, I guess. He went into the water, I begged him and tried to dissuade him, but he still swam. He reached the middle and started drowning. No one else was around, just a barking dog and me a skinny 15-year-old. I thought I was going to drown with him. I barely managed to pull him out of the water. Jennifer looked at him with concern. How awful. What happened afterward? She asked. Did your uncle at least thank you? He didn't even remember what had happened. Matthew chuckled. My uncle and Eddie slept until morning, worrying about not catching any fish. The only witness to my heroic deed was the dog, but it's still unfair. Jennifer remarked, it must have been frustrating to do a good deed for someone and not receive any gratitude. Matthew shrugged, those who chase after gratitude don't belong among lifeguards, he said. You just have to do your job and not expect anyone's thanks. I don't know, Jennifer mumbled. It still doesn't seem fair. And you don't believe me, Matthew said. Don't be too quick to believe what people say. Maybe I made up this whole story. The girl shook her head. No, I believe you. I can't explain why. Besides, what would be the point of making something like that up? To make an impression on you, Matthew replied. I think you didn't need to try that hard. Jennifer smiled. You already made an impression on me back there on the beach. The girl was pleased to note that her words had made Matthew somewhat uneasy. If someone like Cole were in his place, he would have started talking about his own heroics and boasting. Although, someone like Cole would never be in Matthew's place, Jennifer thought. People like him only know how to do nasty things, and if someone needs help, they immediately disappear into the bushes. So, what do you do? Matthew asked. Changing the subject, do you work or study? Where? And what's your field? I've completed my second year of medical school, Jennifer said. I'm studying to become a doctor, but you know, I doubt I chose this profession because I wanted to do something noble in life. Sometimes I think that way, 
but then I realize I just followed my mother's wishes. I never had any particular ambitions, and my mom wanted me to get a good education, become a respected specialist, you know, so I ended up in medicine. Matthew nodded. Yes, and if you succeed, you'll be a much greater lifesaver than me. What's my beach sitting compared to the deeds performed on an operating table? No surgeries for me, Jennifer protested. You're overestimating my abilities a bit. I'd like to become a pediatrician to treat children, or maybe a general practitioner. My grandfather is very old, and he has many health issues. I think it would be nice to have our family doctor, but you must have some hobbies. Matthew persisted. There must be something you enjoy doing. The girl fell into deep thought. I used to enjoy drawing in my youth, she confessed. I would like to continue doing it and develop my skills, but it takes a lot of money for that. Plus, who would buy paintings from an unknown artist? Maybe my mom is right. I need a reliable profession that I can make a living from. Matthew shrugged. Our conversation has taken a gloomy turn. He mumbled. I'm not much of a lifeguard, you see. I work at a factory, in the shop, and here I am on my day official in reality. I wanted to become a traveler, someone like a tour guide, showing beautiful places to people. And instead, I've turned into a city dweller. I see mountains once every five years. But life isn't over yet, right? Jennifer remarked. So, there's no reason to be down. Who knows what tomorrow will bring? Maybe I'll win a million in the lottery, and they'll promote you to the factory director. Then you'll spend every vacation skiing in the mountains, and I'll hire a whole team of doctors for my grandfather and devote all my time to painting. Dreaming is not harmful, Matthew grinned. It's harmful not to dream. Honestly, why are we different? We still have everything ahead of us. Let's drink to that. They clanked their glasses together. Jennifer took a sip of the now lukewarm tea and realized that she hadn't had such an easy and straightforward conversation with someone in a long time. Elle was her friend, but she was constantly nagging Jennifer, giving life advice, and criticizing her choice of clothes. Jennifer realized that she hadn't come to the tourist base in vain, meeting Matthew was worth it. The time on the clock was approaching midnight. Jennifer unintentionally started yawning. I'll walk you back, Matthew suggested. It's getting late. We'll chat some more tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll have to head back home, the girl said sadly. We only have the booking until noon. Well, no one will kick you out of here, Matthew pointed out. You can stay until the evening, and then I'll drive you to the city in my car. My shift will be over by then. They walked out of the cottage and headed towards the cottages. Lanterns were already lit along the path. Jennifer felt a strange embarrassment, as if she had turned back into a schoolgirl returning home with a classmate. Considering that she hadn't been particularly popular among her peers during her school years, all of this was unfamiliar and new to her. Unexpectedly, a familiar voice rang out nearby hoarse, with shrill notes, like an angry old woman. It sent shivers down Jennifer's spine. There he eyes. Cole yelled, pointing his finger in their direction. This guy stole my girlfriend. Jennifer gasped in fear. Not only did the redhead refuse to leave her alone, but he had also brought Paul with him. Both of them had already had quite a bit to drink and looked incredibly angry. Him. Paul asked in confirmation. So this is the guy who ruined everything for us. Well, now the two of us will teach him a lesson. It's still a big question of who's going to teach whom. Matthew replied. Jennifer tugged at his arm. Let's go from here. There are two of them, and you're alone. But they can barely stand on their feet. Matthew protested. Just look at them, but they're angry, and that's even worse. Jennifer retorted, let's go, please. Matthew, you said yourself that your friend Matt would get into trouble because of all this. Matthew was still hesitating when Elle appeared on the path. She was even angrier than Cole and Paul combined, and she immediately started shouting. I thought you were a decent guy, and look at you. You left me in the middle of the dance floor and walked away, and then I had to deal with some drunks who started bothering me. Although... Who am I calling a drunk? You're not any better. Paul turned and pushed her, causing her to fall into the bushes with a scream. Now you're definitely going to pay. Paul promised, and with one swift blow, he sent Paul to the ground. He turned to Cole, but retribution came from an unexpected source. Out of nowhere, the sister of the redhead swooped in like a hurricane, 
showering her brother with punches and curses. I can't keep an eye on you anymore, she yelled. I've had enough of you. Tomorrow, I'm complaining to dad. Cole somehow deflated and lost his fighting spirit. He muttered through clenched teeth. You've really pushed me to the limit, Jane. We could argue about who's had enough of whom, Jane shouted. But this is the last time I'm going anywhere with you, mark my words. From today on, you'll either stay home or find a job. It's high time someone took care of you, your parents have spoiled you enough. But now it's all going to end. Let's go already. With prodding and nudging, Jennifer led the guy towards the house. Nobody paid any attention to Paul, who was groaning beneath the lamppost. The onlookers exchanged glances as the young couple passed by. Matthew mumbled, I used to dream of having a little brother or sister when I was a kid. Now I understand that those dreams were in vain. What a headache these dreams can be, right? Jennifer nervously chuckled. What kind of vacation had she ended up with? It was either perfect bliss or constant drama. El, swaying as she got to her feet, muttered, What a cavalier we've got here. I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. She spat out a speck of dirt and started smoothing the hem of her dress. El's appearance was quite pitiful. Shall we go to bed? Jennifer cautiously suggested. I think we've had enough adventures for today. Her friend nodded and glanced at Matthew. You again, she remarked. You know, it was pretty clear from the start that you would bring us nothing but trouble. I'm very pleased to meet you too, Matthew nodded. What's wrong, L? Jennifer said with some irritation. Matthew saved me from Cole and just now avenged you. Aren't you satisfied with that? L let out a heavy sigh. Oh, I'm thrilled, absolutely thrilled. I just want to jump for joy, she muttered. Imagine, a day that started so well. You go on vacation, and it turns out that the guy who looked like a prince is just a regular jerk. But the popper isn't half bad, he's worth a second look. Jennifer gave her friend an angry look, but El just smirked. Okay, okay, I got it, it's taken. El conceded. You're right, we need to go to sleep. Is your escort going to see us off? He's not mine. Jennifer almost blurted out, but then she bit her tongue. Maybe it was because deep down, she wasn't entirely opposed to the idea of Matthew becoming hers. Throughout the journey, El kept glancing at Matthew sideways. Jennifer knew that her silence wouldn't last long. When her friend had been drinking, words flowed out of her like a river, and this time was no different. Can I ask what sport you're into? She inquired of Matthew. You look pretty fit. Maybe boxing. You could have knocked Paul out, right? Or perhaps you're into wrestling. Wanted to bring everyone to their knees. Jennifer could see that Matthew was becoming uncomfortable with all these questions. It seemed he wasn't accustomed to such persistent attention. Professionally, nothing. He mumbled, just swimming and occasionally hitting the gym. So, if this had continued, we might have witnessed a gritty street fight, L concluded. Not bad at all. It's a shame it all ended so quickly. L, Jennifer reproached her. Why would you say something like that? As she spoke these words, the girl smirked so slyly that Jennifer felt like shouting at her. What had she gotten them into, and what would their new acquaintance think of them? Elle disappeared behind the door, and Jennifer, blushing, looked at Matthew. I'm sorry about all of this, she mumbled. Elle has always been like that. She just talks nonsense all the time. I've noticed, Matthew chuckled. She's quite a lively girl. It's hard not to notice her. Jennifer was immediately disheartened. Did that remark mean that he already liked Elle or, however, he quickly dispelled her worries by adding. I guess someone next to your friend can only be an extreme enthusiast, a lover of dangerous adventures. It's like being on a volcano with her. I feel sorry for that guy in advance. He's in for quite a ride. So, see you tomorrow. Jennifer asked timidly. A taxi will be waiting for you at the gate. Matthew saluted her, but not before evening, as we agreed. Jennifer watched him until he was out of sight and then entered the cottage. As expected, Elle had no intention of going to sleep. She was waiting for her friend with eager eyes. You are back so soon, she chided her. I thought I'd have to wait an eternity, and here you are. Did you at least kiss? Jennifer brushed off her friend's chatter. What are you talking about, Elle, she said. We've only known each other for one day. What kind of kissing are you expecting? It's like you didn't grow up on romance novels. Elle shook her head. Don't you remember that a knight is entitled to a reward for rescuing a fair lady? 
cut it out. But Elle had no intention of letting up. Do you at least like him? Jennifer thought for a moment and nodded. I guess so. And without the I guess, her friend teased. I like him. Jennifer blushed. So, are you satisfied? For your sake, yes, Elle replied. But it seems I'll have to visit this place again. Maybe I'll find myself a rescuer too. Jennifer smiled. Her friend was truly incorrigible. To bounce back so quickly after a setback and prepare for battle again. Who else but Elle was capable of such a thing? Jennifer herself was not at all confident. She was happy to spend another day with Matthew, and that was it. She didn't expect their acquaintance to go any further. Sitting together on the beach, solving another intricate crossword puzzle that was the extent of her dreams. Perhaps their acquaintance would have ended there if Matthew hadn't discovered the girl's secret. You don't know how to swim, he asked skeptically. Seriously, would I joke about that? Jennifer sighed. I guess it's because I grew up without a father, there was no one to teach me, and my mom doesn't swim either. Can you imagine how upsetting it was in childhood when the kids from our neighborhood would all go to the beach together, play in the water, and I'd wander in the shallows, too afraid to go any further. I still remember it and get upset. It's something that can be fixed. Matthew reassured her. I can teach you. I know a thing or two about swimming. Teach me. Jennifer asked in disbelief. In one lesson, why just one? Matthew was surprised. No, if you prove to be a capable student and catch on quickly, I'd be glad, but there's no need to rush. It's better to learn everything properly to feel more confident in the water. Learn to dive, swim different styles. Jennifer didn't want to reveal her fears to Matthew. She couldn't bring herself to tell him that she was afraid not of the water, but of the possibility that he might want to see her more often, to schedule meetings deliberately. To keep seeing her. You don't need a swimming coach. You need a psychologist. Elle sighed when Jennifer told her about it. Jennifer, why do you constantly think you're worse than others? You're a pretty girl. Jennifer couldn't explain it herself. It was as if she had some sort of complex. Deep down, she believed that a guy like Matthew simply couldn't seriously be interested in her. Their meetings continued, and Matthew kept his promise he taught Jennifer to swim. Although, to her embarrassment, she turned out to be a hopeless student. It seems I'm not cut out for this, she muttered, once again shaking the water from her ear. Learning is tough. Fighting is easy. Matthew encouraged her. You'll see. Soon, you'll surpass everyone. I hope it happens quickly. Jennifer sighed, feeling uncomfortable under the gaze of other vacationers and the open ridicule from the younger kids who swam better than her. Soon, progress was made. And by the end of the summer, Jennifer easily outswam her friend. Elle was amazed by her transformation. I look at you and envy you, she admitted. I wish I could find a handsome guy to teach me karate or boxing. With age, I've come to realize that every girl should know self-defense techniques. With age, Jennifer laughed. Come on, Elle, you're only 20. Well, negative experiences add up, Elle sighed. Are you talking about that incident at the tourist camp? Jennifer asked, concerned, is Paul trying to get in touch with you? Let him try, after what he did there. Her friend protested, but if I'm serious, I can't even imagine what I would have done back then. He tossed me aside like a feather. I either need to gain weight urgently, up to a ton, or learn to fight back. Starting this fall, I'll look for some kind of martial arts class to be ready. And there, of course, you'll fall in love with some Rambo. Jennifer concluded, smiling. Elle shrugged. Rambo or not, I hadn't given up hope of meeting my Prince Charming. By the way, you hadn't told your mom about Matthew. Jennifer shook her head. Not like you, Elle exclaimed. Why are you keeping him a secret? We're just friends, it seems. Jennifer mumbled. Yeah, friends. Elle scoffed. I saw you kissing when you said goodbye last time. Friends don't do that, but seriously, why don't you want Courtney to know about him? Jennifer couldn't really explain it. She felt that her mother wouldn't take her timid feelings seriously. She'd start asking awkward questions of both her and Matthew. But who was Jennifer fooling? Deep down, she suspected that Courtney wouldn't be thrilled with her choice. When sending her daughter to medical school, Courtney had hinted that it was an excellent opportunity to meet a worthy husband in the future. Courtney probably expected Jennifer to marry a department head or, at the very least, a specialist. 
and this guy was just an ordinary factory worker. Still, hiding Matthew forever didn't make sense. Gathering her courage, Jennifer finally invited him over for a home-cut dinner. To her immense relief, Courtney didn't treat him rudely. She didn't say much during the dinner, probably still in shock. Judging by Matthew's expression, he wasn't entirely comfortable either. However, he actively engaged in conversation and held himself very well. I plan to enroll in distance learning in the future. He explained, I don't want to spend my whole life behind a machine. I'll be pursuing a higher education. And when exactly is this future? Courtney cautiously inquired, you could drag it out until retirement. Maybe in a year, Matthew replied, right now, my father is ill and a lot of money is going toward his medication. When he left, Courtney slowly began clearing the table as if she were in a trance. Jennifer helped her and waited for the impending argument. However, nothing of the sort happened. Apparently, her mother was in such shock that she couldn't find the words. So, how did you two meet? She finally asked. You mentioned something about the tourist camp, but you didn't give any details. Matthew saved me from some hooligans. Jennifer replied, not just once, but twice. Did all the city's criminals gather at that tourist camp? Courtney asked shaking her head without waiting for an answer. It's like a romance novel, honestly. Probably that's why you liked him. You've always been sensitive to tear-jerking stories. Jennifer chose not to respond to that. Maybe your mother had a point about something, but it all sounded rather condescending. After pondering for a while, Courtney wiped the same plate for the third time and then nodded. All right, date for now. We'll see how it goes. He doesn't seem like an alcoholic or a scoundrel, at least, but no foolishness, you hear me. We don't need any of those melodramatic soap operas, unplanned children. What are you talking about, mom? Jennifer protested. Of course, nothing like that will happen. It's not like you don't know me. In response, Courtney uttered a sentence that wounded Jennifer to her core. You know, after what happened today, I feel like I don't really know you. But deep down, Jennifer hoped that everything would eventually work out. And roughly speaking, it did. Maybe Courtney wasn't thrilled with her daughter's choice, but she didn't openly object. There were no scandals, no ironic remarks upon their meetings, none of that. Yet, Jennifer understood that deep down, her mother hoped that this wasn't serious, believing it was just a youthful infatuation that would disappear overnight. She expected that this awkward situation would somehow resolve itself. However, one year passed, then another, and another, but everything remained the same. Jennifer diligently pursued her medical studies, delving into the intricacies of medicine, and was on her way to becoming a therapist. Matthew got a promotion at the factory and enrolled in college. Time for their meetings became scarce, yet they didn't break up. L, watching them, couldn't fathom it. What, all this complexity? She wondered, I don't understand you. You should have married long ago and lived together. How many years have you been dating like teenagers? Elle knew what she was talking about. Just as she promised, Elle had joined a self-defense class for girls, where a very attractive guy was the instructor. Elle fondly remembered their first meeting. As soon as I saw Thomas, I knew it was him. She would recount. I fell in love at first sight. And of course, his muscles and his perfectly styled hair had nothing to do with it, right? Jennifer teased her. Not in the slightest. Elle assured her. It was a soul connection. I'm telling you, so why haven't you and Matthew gotten married? You didn't answer that. He's afraid he won't be able to provide for me properly. Jennifer sighed. I told you, Matthew's father is seriously ill. They spend a lot of money on his medication. His parents live in the village, and it's tough for them. Besides, he still has to pay for his education and rent an apartment. So what? Elle was surprised. You're not the type to marry for money. I'm not, Jennifer reassured her. It's also complicated for you guys, Elle sighed. Maybe your biggest mistake was choosing medicine. You could have studied to be an accountant in college, worked in some office, and lived happily with your bi friend. Here, it's just constant difficulties. On her way home that evening, Jennifer continued to ponder, what should she do, and how could she untangle this knot that had formed in her life? Matthew didn't want to get married until he had more money and Courtney wouldn't allow her daughter to be with a man without an engagement ring. That was never even discussed, and Matthew himself wasn't the type to run away from marriage, 
If he said it was too early, it meant he wouldn't even live with her in a common-law marriage. Everyone is so proper, Jennifer thought, and everything seems right, just as it should be, but there's no way out of this situation. As she stepped into the hallway, Jennifer noticed two pairs of shoes by the door, men's boots and women's low-heeled shoes. It seemed they had guests, and Jennifer didn't like it one bit. Cartney peeked out from the kitchen, wearing a wide smile. Look who's here, she said in an unnaturally cheerful voice. Come on in, Jennifer. We've been waiting for you. The girl raised her eyebrows questioningly. Her mother had never greeted her so warmly. There was no doubt that all of this was a performance staged for someone else's benefit. Looks like we have guests, Courtney cheerfully announced. My school friend Aisha and her son Elliot. It's been ages since I saw them. Why did she bring her son along? Jennifer wanted to ask but stopped herself just in time. Firstly, it would be rude, and secondly, she already had some suspicions. Most likely, Courtney decided to take an indirect route, avoiding a confrontation with her daughter over Matthew. She simply arranged a gathering and brought a different suitor in his place. Jennifer was anxious about the kind of people she might meet in the kitchen. Meet my Jennifer, Courtney said, ushering her daughter into the kitchen. At the table were two people, a plump woman in a colorful dress who appeared to be Courtney's contemporary, and a slim young man with glasses perched on his nose. Jennifer could tell from his appearance that he was a typical high achiever, one of those who couldn't go a day without a book. Although Jennifer herself was the same way, she had no desire to strike up a conversation with such individuals. Aisha nodded and introduced herself while her son went a step further. He stood up, straightened his suit as if preparing for a stage performance, and said, I'm Elliot, a doctoral student working on my dissertation in history, a future scholar. Jennifer barely concealed a smile as she listened to this recitation. I'm Jennifer, she said, a medical student in my fifth year. Soon, I'll be a therapist at the clinic. Maybe you'll come to me for an appointment. No, Aisha mumbled and quickly corrected herself. I don't mean to say that you'll be a bad doctor, Jennifer, but it's better not to get sick in the first place. I'm sure you understand. Jennifer nodded and looked at Courtney, awaiting further instructions. She felt that her role as a gracious hostess had been fulfilled. I was just telling our guests about your plans and dreams, Courtney said. Aisha was absolutely amazed by you. She said that in our time, such determination and willpower in young people are rare. In our whole town, it's only you and my Elliot with such ambitions. That's right, Aisha confirmed. All the kids from good families these days, if you ask around, have no particular aspirations. They work at car washes and seem content. In Jennifer's opinion, all of this was a huge exaggeration, and it sounded downright funny to go to such lengths to bring them together and extol her son. And the way in people spend their free time is frightening to think about, Aisha continued. They drink, smoke, listen to inappropriate music. Elliot nodded in a sanctimonious manner, affirming every word his mother uttered. Then he turned to Jennifer and asked, and how do you like to have fun? What are your hobbies? I, for one, adore collecting, mainly numismatics, but I also have a thing for vintage cars, you know, those small replicas of real cars. And next summer, I plan to go to Sierra de Arapuerca. My professor told me in secret that there are excavations planned there, and I have a good chance of joining the team. I love dancing, Jennifer said. I go to the club every weekend and dance until the early hours. By any chance, did we ever meet there? Your face looks familiar to me. Elliot shook his head bewilderedly, and Jennifer continued, and next summer, I'd like to go on a resort vacation. To Turkey or the Emirates, I'm not sure yet. Just lying on the beach all day and sipping cocktails through a straw. My boyfriend is already saving up for this trip, I promise. Jennifer didn't know what had come over her. She vividly pictured the resort she and Matthew supposedly planned to visit, almost hearing the sound of waves and feeling the touch of the wind on her face. Aisha and her son were in shock as they stared at Jennifer. Then the woman coldly said, Thank you for the tea, Courtney. We should probably be going. The guests hurriedly retreated to the hallway, as if Jennifer were about to chase after them. A moment later, the front door slammed shut, and Courtney looked at her daughter with indignation. What was that all about? What nonsense did you tell them? Well, actually, Mom, I wanted to ask you the same thing. Jennifer replied, What's with this matchmaking? 
And without warning, do you think I don't understand why you brought this Elliot here? What's he doing here? Sweetie, the years are passing by, Courtney said. It's time for you to think about your personal life. What about Matthew? Of course, you forgot. Jennifer remarked. You'll forget about him too. Her mother sighed. Jennifer, you must understand that all of this is not serious. Matthew, that guy from the factory, he's all empty promises. It's time to leave all this nonsense behind and find a decent suitor. Matthew is decent. Jennifer asserted firmly. I don't need anyone else, and you should stop this matchmaking. Otherwise, to the next suitor you bring home, I'll say that we go clubbing together, and you outdance everyone at the club. I think your friends won't appreciate that. For the first time in her life, she allowed herself to speak this way to her mother. Jennifer was deeply hurt for Matthew, who was unfairly deemed inadequate by her family, as if they were in a hurry for her to get married. Sensing that she was on the verge of tears, Jennifer rushed into the hallway. Where are you going? Courtney asked in alarm. After Elliot, is it? I don't need any Elliot. Jennifer yelled. I just want to be alone for a while. She walked out of the building and sat down on a bench. The street was rapidly getting darker and the courtyard was completely empty. Jennifer took out her phone and messaged her friend. You won't believe what's happening at my house. Total chaos. Elle responded almost immediately. Are you fighting with your mom? She asked. We've already fought. My mom started introducing guys to me. Can you believe it? Seriously. How many of them are there? Are they good looking? Elle inquired. Jennifer let out a heavy sigh. Sometimes, Elle's way of turning everything into a joke amused her, but at this moment, it only irritated her. Not funny, she replied. There was only one suitor, but he was worth several. Some future scientific luminary. You can't imagine what a snob and a bore he was. When he heard that I spend every weekend at the disco, he ran out of the apartment and his mother followed suit. You said you go to the disco. Elle was surprised. I didn't expect such a thing from you. If you've come up with such fantasies, it must have really gotten to you. And Courtney didn't say why she did this. You do have a boyfriend, right? I told her. Jennifer replied. Mom doesn't consider Matthew reliable enough. She says he's procrastinating with the wedding and he's just a big talker. This time, Elle didn't respond immediately. She remained silent for a while and then tactfully remarked, maybe in some ways, Courtney is right, isn't she? We've been together for so many years and Matthew always claims he doesn't have enough money for the wedding. These are all feeble excuses, don't you think? Jennifer didn't respond to that. She bitterly thought that no one understood her, not even her friend. Why did everyone so firmly believe that Matthew was simply leading her on? as if they knew life better than her. She continued to sit on the bench, intending to spend the night there if necessary. She didn't want to go back home. Jennifer gazed at the stars lighting up in the sky and dreamed of escaping far away to a place where she would feel good and comfortable, like the beach where she and Matthew first met. A car stopped near the entrance. Jennifer turned her head and was almost taken aback in surprise. For a moment, it seemed like everything happening was just a dream. Maybe she had actually fallen asleep in the courtyard and was dreaming. Matthew emerged from the taxi with two roses in his hand. His formal suit was all crumpled and his trousers were torn at the knees. Jennifer looked at him and couldn't find words. Then she asked, what happened? You look like you were running from the law. Matthew shrugged sheepishly. That's pretty much what happened, he said. I was almost caught red-handed in the act when I was stealing flowers from the park and the store on the corner turned out to be closed. I didn't have any other ideas, so I had to make do with two roses, one for you and one for Courtney. Initially, I wanted to get a huge bouquet. Jennifer burst out laughing. You goofball. Why? Because proposals come with flowers, Matthew replied. Are you willing to marry me? Jennifer began to understand something. Did Elle call you? She asked. Matthew nodded shamefacedly. Oh God, why did she have to do that? Jennifer groaned. I didn't ask her to. Matthew handed her the rose. Jennifer took it and said hesitantly, I don't want you to marry me under pressure just because someone said something. It makes me uncomfortable. If it's gotten to the point where your mother is bringing in other suitors, then I'm truly in danger, Matthew joked sadly. More specifically, my heart is, L is right. There's no point in delaying any longer. Marry me. Do you really want this? 
Jennifer asked. Of course, would I jump over a fence at midnight if it wasn't serious? Matthew replied. Jennifer looked at him uncertainly. Matthew was smiling so warmly that it melted her heart. I agree, she whispered. That's great, Matthew nodded. We're just missing the rings. Wait a minute. I need to do something about that. He plucked a few blades of grass from the lawn and fashioned a makeshift ring. Matthew placed it on Jennifer's finger. Sorry, all the jewelry stores are closed at this hour, and I haven't resorted to stealing gold yet, Matthew said with embarrassment. So, we'll have to make do with this for tonight, but tomorrow. Jennifer shook her head. I don't need a ring, she replied. This is the best. It doesn't matter if it's made of grass or gold, as long as you're by my side. The news of their wedding came as a shock to Courtney. She silently accepted the rose from her future son-in-law, listened to her daughter's story, and slumped into a chair, utterly exhausted. Jennifer, please put the kettle on, she said in a mournful voice. I guess we should celebrate this news. When Matthew and Jennifer stepped out onto the balcony, Matthew nervously remarked, I seem to have misplaced my roses. I can't see any joy on your mother's face. It's okay, there will be joy and smiles later. Jennifer sighed. I wasn't particularly thrilled either when I walked into the apartment a few hours ago and found some graduate students sitting there. I definitely didn't feel like laughing. And I'm not even a graduate student, Matthew said gloomily. I haven't even completed my higher education. Jennifer firmly shook her head. I've told you a hundred times that none of that matters. Contrary to Courtney's desire for a lavish celebration, they decided not to go all out. Jennifer outright refused to invite distant aunts, uncles, and other relatives whom nobody had seen in years. No need to deceive people, she said. It's all silly and outdated. Your fiancé simply can't handle it. That's why you're refusing. Courtney muttered. In any case, it's silly to invite your brother who borrowed a substantial sum from you five years ago and disappeared without a trace. Jennifer replied, unless you are hoping he'll repay the debt. And your cousin last called us a year ago, asking me what her grandson's cough sounded like. Mom, do you really think these people care about my wedding? It seems to me they couldn't care less whether we're alive or not. Courtney frowned but didn't argue further. Jennifer only invited their closest friends to the wedding, just a couple of girls from her group. Matthew also didn't invite many guests, as his witness. He had that very Matt whom he had replaced as a lifeguard on the day they met at the beach. Jennifer had met him before and sometimes shuddered at the thought of what would have happened if he hadn't been there that day. Matt wasn't a bad person at all. On the contrary, he was somewhat reminiscent of graduate student Elliot. Thin, wearing glasses, and not at all cut out to be a defender. The girl sincerely wondered what her fiancé and this guy had in common. Perhaps, besides work, there was nothing. Matt also worked at the factory. He was a maintenance fitter, and he had no dreams of reaching great heights. He had no grand plans for his life, and he didn't dream of traveling or having a cottage. A wife, a son, and a small apartment inherited from his parents were enough for this Matt. On the one hand, Jennifer also didn't dream of anything extravagant. But on the other hand, the way Matt lived made her feel depressed. Who's that bore? Elle whispered. Is he, by any chance, the graduate student your mother was trying to set you up with? He looks a lot like him. He's Matthew's friend. Jennifer replied in a hushed tone. Really? Elle was surprised. She shifted her gaze between Matthew and his friend and then shrugged. I thought some random person had walked in. I didn't think your husband would have friends like him. Maybe you rushed into marrying him after all. You know what they say, tell me who your friend is, and I'll tell you who you are. What if your Matthew reads Friedrich Nietzsche at night, or something equally pretentious? Now that would be a surprise. At the time, the girls just laughed at that joke. But later, Jennifer often recalled those words. But why did her husband end up with such a friend? If Matt hadn't been in their lives, everything could have turned out quite differently. They spent their honeymoon at the same tourist camp where they had met. This place meant more to Jennifer than the most luxurious resort. She was happy sitting in the lifeguard's empty seat in the evening, fluttering her eyelashes playfully. I can't think of what we'll do today. I didn't bring any crossword puzzles, she said. But we still have the river all to ourselves. Matthew winked and led Jennifer to the water. We haven't swum together in a while. Jennifer barely remembered that time. They kissed, they kissed a lot, 
To Jennifer, it seemed like every minute spent without kissing was a waste. After the wedding, the newlyweds moved into Matthew's apartment. At first, things weren't easy for them. Of course, Jennifer didn't regret marrying him, but they really didn't have enough money for married life. Once the initial infatuation in the rosy haze lifted from her thoughts, Jennifer discovered a multitude of problems. Nevertheless, the young couple didn't despair. They approached all the domestic difficulties with humor, as if they were some kind of jokes. They arranged small picnics in nature instead of going to cafes. Jennifer mastered a variety of recipes and managed to prepare lunch from the most modest set of products. Somehow, they survived that time. Perhaps, the trials even brought the young couple closer together. A year later, Jennifer found a job at the Poly Clinic, and things became a little easier. I can't believe I buy my favorite chocolates every month now. Jennifer murmured, enjoying the scent of chocolate. They used to be in our house only on holidays. She said she didn't like sweets. Matthew teased her with a smile. Jennifer immediately backtracked. Actually, it's really not healthy for your teeth and your skin. It would be better to do without them. As long as you have that satisfied expression on your face, enjoy them, Matthew said. I think we've earned a little luxury, don't you? The young couple didn't stop at just chocolates. Jennifer finally bought herself a new dress, the one she had been eyeing in the store for the past two months. Matthew also treated himself to some updates, watching him fix his hair in front of the mirror. Jennifer jealously remarked, Soon, I'll be scared to let you go to work. I bet all the girls there are ogling you. Let them, Matthew assured her. I only have eyes for you. I sneak a look at your photos during the workday until the boss notices. You know what's missing in those photos. What? Jennifer asked with a hint of anxiety. For some reason, she assumed that her pictures lacked long legs or a perfect figure, but the man meant something entirely different. Photos from the seaside, he said. Starting next paycheck, I'll start booking tickets. No more postponing. We're flying south. They indeed traveled to the south of France, and then a year later, to Turkey. They dreamed of embarking on a round-the-world journey, seeing the entire world. But none of that happened. Instead of a round-the-world trip, there was Matt in his country house. Matt rarely appeared in their lives unless he had some problem. They used to meet at family gatherings or friendly picnics. But since Matt had his second child, that was over. The man had suddenly become serious and abandoned all his amusements. One must think about family, he would solemnly declare. It was a correct statement in essence, but he said it with such a sanctimonious tone that anyone who disagreed with his words felt like a lost soul. I hate this sanctimony, Jennifer confided in Nell, and it feels wrong to say this, but I wish Matthew didn't have friends at all rather than ones like him. This guy is taking advantage of your kindness, and if you ever need help, he'll be nowhere to be found. I've seen such people, Elle responded. As it turned out, later on, her friend was right. It was a Friday evening. Matthew came home from work tired, and the couple was about to have dinner when Matthew's phone rang. Matt, Matthew immediately recognized. He broke his arm last week, tripped over a curb, can you believe it? Now he's on sick leave. I wonder why he's calling so late. Maybe something happened. Matthew picked up the phone and listened to his friend's excited chatter for a while. Then he asked in surprise why he was calling so late. Couldn't it wait until tomorrow? Matt continued talking. Matthew sighed. All right, I'll be there shortly. He hung up, and Jennifer asked with concern. Any troubles? Matthew waved his hand irritably. Matt's in a bit of a jam. Tomorrow, his wife's parents are coming over, and he's taking them and the kids to the country house because there's not enough space in the apartment for everyone. According to Matt, it's a total mess at the dacha. Something's leaking here. Something needs fixing there. He says his mother-in-law is a real general, and if everything isn't in order, she'll give him a hard time. He asked me to go help. Are you going? Jennifer asked. Right after work. Where else can I go? Matthew replied without much enthusiasm. After all, Matt is my friend. For him, you might be a friend, but what is he to you? Jennifer inquired. You know, real friends don't act this way. It's the end of the work week. You're exhausted, and you have to go to some late night jobs, as you call it. Matthew remained silent. Last time, Matt asked you for help with furniture. Jennifer continued. 
and you carried those cabinets up to the fifth floor for him. I can't forget how I struggled with your back afterward. Your friend just said a simple thank you, and all those times you covered for him at work, all for this so-called friend of yours, only brought trouble. This is the last time, Matthew assured her genuinely. Let him deal with his mother-in-law on his own next time. Besides, he has a broken arm. He can't even drive. Matthew kissed her and left. Jennifer had dinner without much appetite and turned on the television. The antics of the performers brought her no relief, only increasing her irritation. The plate of soup, which Matthew hadn't even touched, was a sore spot for her. She was angry at Matt for dragging her husband out of the house in the middle of the night and for not thinking to make sandwiches for him on the way. She was upset with the whole world. Jennifer had had a long day, but she didn't want to go to bed without her husband. She was spending her first night alone at home, and it felt strange and a bit eerie. It reminded her of her childhood when her mother would leave her to stay with her sick grandfather overnight. Since then, Jennifer had grown up, but the nightmares from those distant years, as she would later discover, hadn't gone anywhere. She listened intently to every creak and rustle, to the barking of a stray dog outside. Yet, that eerie feeling wouldn't leave her alone. She tried to push it away, but later, Jennifer would call that strange sensation a premonition. Rain began to drizzle outside, and as she watched the drops sliding down the window pane, a sense of melancholy enveloped her. Jennifer couldn't shake it off. A couple of hours of agonizing waiting, and her hand reached for the phone on its own. The ringing seemed to last an eternity. When Matthew answered, his voice sounded tired, despite his efforts to hide it. Why aren't you sleeping, dear? He inquired. It's quite late. I feel sad without you, Jennifer replied. Even sleeping is sad. Matthew wondered, even sleeping. Matthew didn't laugh at her whims, nor did he call her a fantasist. His voice remained gentle. Get some sleep, and time will pass faster. He said, we'll see each other in the morning, and in the meantime, I'll visit you in your dreams. Deal. Tears welled up in Jennifer's eyes. She nodded and whispered, yes, just come back quickly, okay? Well. I did promise you, Matthew replied, and you know I always keep my word, right. In the background, they heard some complaining from Matt. The connection was lost, and Jennifer set her phone aside, wiping her cheeks. I guess I've completely fallen apart, she thought. Perhaps I should really take some valerian and go to bed. Matthew's right, it'll make the time pass faster. Jennifer went to bed but couldn't fall asleep. The rain outside, her neighbor's cough, footsteps in the hallway. All these noises disturbed her. Jennifer felt like she'd spent the whole night with her eyes wide open. When dawn broke, she got up and started preparing breakfast. She still felt guilty for not having fed her husband dinner, so she decided to make it up to him with a lavish breakfast. She even baked a pie, despite her exhaustion. Lunchtime was approaching, and Matthew still hadn't returned. Jennifer's patience was wearing thin. I'll show him, she thought remembering Matt. If Matthew can't muster the courage to talk to him, then I will. I'll tell that guy everything I think about him. It's about time. He's just exploiting our free labor. Jennifer dialed her husband's number, but there was no answer. Moreover, his phone was out of range. Maybe it's out of battery, Jennifer thought. Though it's highly unlikely, her thoughts began to turn toward the worst case scenarios. What if something happened to Matthew at the country house? What if he had an accident, like his unreliable friend? Maybe he broke a leg or an arm. No, Matthew wasn't that careless. But what if he got into a car accident? He was so exhausted when he left, he could have fallen asleep at the wheel, especially in this constraint. No, that couldn't be. They were both caught up in their work and lost track of time. They forgot about exhaustion, didn't they? A treacherous voice in her head whispered, no matter how much work there is, after a sleepless night, Matthew would be completely worn out, and you know it. Jennifer didn't have Matthew's friend's phone numbers, so she just paced around the apartment like a caged lioness. After a while, Elle called her, her voice cheerful and carefree. Am I interrupting something? Are you busy? Elle asked. Because if you want, you can come over to my place. We can reminisce about our youth, have a girl's night. I'd love to see you and have some cake together." Her friend's voice sounded so lively and carefree, creating such a contrast with Jennifer's mood that for a moment, she felt like she was going insane. 
I'm sorry, L, I can't. Jennifer mumbled. Matthew isn't here today either. He went to help Matt with some repairs at their country house. That killed Joy again. L asked disapprovingly. Then even more so. Why should you suffocate alone? Come over to my place. You don't understand, L. Jennifer replied. Matthew left yesterday evening and should have been back by now. But he's still not here, and he's not answering calls. What kind of cake can there be? I can't imagine what to do. Jennifer felt like she was about to burst into tears. Her friend spoke in an apologetic tone. So, that's what's going on. I'm sorry, I had no idea. I tried calling that bore. Does he have phone troubles too? I don't have his number, Jennifer replied. I've never been to his place, not even as a guest. I only remember the street and the building, but it's a 16-story complex. So all I can do is go there and shout under the windows. Maybe someone will respond. Well, you should have some calming drink, and I'll try to find out something, Elle advised. Jennifer followed her friend's advice, but even after having a whole bottle of the calming elixir, she couldn't find peace. Her soul was restless, urging her to do something. Elle called her back half an hour later, her voice devoid of any cheerfulness and filled with tension. Remind me, which road do you take to that boar's country house? She asked. I have no idea. Jennifer honestly admitted. My head is such a mess right now that I can't even remember the way to my own workplace. Why do you ask? Well, at least tell me the name of the village if you know it, Elle persisted. I can't recall it exactly, Jennifer said. And what kind of car does this boar have? Could you please just explain what's going on? Jennifer couldn't hold back her frustration. Am I supposed to fill out some kind of questionnaire? Elle didn't react to her outburst remaining eerily calm, but her voice grew even grimmer. It's a highway, then, she continued. I just checked the city news forums. There was a major accident today. I don't mean to imply that something terrible happened to your Matthew, but there are traffic jams, you see. Maybe that's why he's delayed. Jennifer no longer listened to her friend. She hung up and started getting ready to go to the hospital. She didn't even think about calling ahead. She couldn't sit still any longer. She had to find out everything in person. The hospital corridors greeted her with emptiness on the Saturday afternoon. Jennifer ran and heard only the sound of her own footsteps echoing off the walls. She approached the reception desk and nodded at the snooty woman busy with some paperwork. Hi, can I find out if there were any accident victims brought in today? She asked. The receptionist blinked in confusion. What? An accident on the highway. Jennifer repeated. Have any of the injured been brought here yet? The woman from the reception nodded. Yes, I heard something about that. I think he's in surgery. He, the word kept pounding in Jennifer's brain as she hurried towards the intensive care unit. For some reason, she was sure they were talking about Matthew. She could always pick him out of a crowd of hundreds. Jennifer remembered a time before they got married when she and her boyfriend agreed to meet at a park. What they didn't consider was that there was a concert happening that day, and it seemed like half the city had gathered there. Jennifer hesitated for a moment, taken aback by the crowd, but then clenched her fists and dove into the midst of it. She found Matthew within minutes. It was as if some kind of intuition led her to him. And now, as Jennifer raced down the hospital corridors, she felt a heart-wrenching realization that she was too late. She should have been there on the highway somehow. Perhaps she could have saved Matthew miraculously. She completely forgot that she was a doctor, that she needed to act calmly and set an example for others. She burst into the ward, nearly colliding with a surgeon. Jennifer looked at his weary face and shouted in fear, Where's my husband? Slow down, miss. The doctor responded irritably. Who are you and who let you in here? I'm the wife of the person who was in the accident today. Jennifer replied, I work right here, in the therapeutic department. Where is he? The surgery just finished. I performed it myself, the surgeon replied, now more politely, apparently recognizing her as a colleague. But why are you so certain it's your husband? His identity hasn't been confirmed yet. I know it's him. Jennifer said curtly, is Matthew alive? Just tell me that, is he okay? He's alive. Calm down, the doctor replied with a slight pause. Let's do this. I'll give you a gown, and you can see for yourself if it's him or not. Then we'll discuss everything else. As Jennifer walked into the patient's room, she was trembling. I just hope it's not Matthew. 
She desperately thought, let them think I'm hysterical throughout the entire hospital, but please let it not be him, anyone but Matthew. And though these thoughts could hardly be called noble, Jennifer was incapable of thinking otherwise in that moment. Jennifer entered the room and paused at the threshold. The surgeon watched her tensely. Do you recognize your husband in this person? He asked. The girl nodded. Yes, it's Matthew, she whispered. What's wrong with him? Ruptured spleen. The surgeon began listing. Multiple contusions, fractures in both legs. So, he'll have to be bedridden. Jennifer gasped. How will Matthew endure that? Normally, he can't sit still for even an hour. The doctor looked at her strangely. But that's not the main issue. He continued. What could be worse? Jennifer asked, sounding like a naive schoolgirl rather than an experienced doctor. Compression fracture of the spine. The surgeon replied, I don't yet know what it will lead to, but you understand the potential consequences. Jennifer had no response to that. Just that one sentence seemed to suck the remaining air out of her, because she understood everything. Matthew regained consciousness the following evening. Jennifer, exceptionally allowed to be by his side, smiled. Hey, what did you dream about? Later, she would remember this moment and wonder where she found the strength to appear so carefree. Although it was more exhaustion than carelessness, Jennifer had simply run out of tears. For a few moments, the man stared at her as if he didn't recognize her. Then he muttered, some nonsense of a dream. I don't even want to talk about it. He paused for a moment and added, I don't feel good, like I have the flu, or worse. You were in an accident, Jennifer said quietly. On your way back from the dacha, with Matt, remember, well, both of you were in it. So, it wasn't a dream. Matthew muttered gloomily, attempted to sit up, but failed. What happened to me? A few fractures, internal injuries, the girl replied. You'd better move as little as possible. A few fractures, he repeated thoughtfully. Well, never mind that. The main thing is I'm alive. Jennifer stroked his hand and prayed that there wouldn't be any more questions. Not right now. Not so soon. Fortunately, Matthew didn't inquire about his health. He was interested in something else. How's Matt? He asked. Is he alive? He was the one behind the wheel. Did Matt get hurt badly? He's fine. Jennifer said with unexpected bitterness. He got away with just some scratches. What angered her the most wasn't the fact that Matt emerged and scathed, but rather that he didn't keep in touch. But why are you like this? Matthew asked in a conciliatory tone. Matt isn't to blame for anything. We were both tired, and there was fog on the road. It could happen to anyone. But it didn't happen to him. It happened to you. Jennifer repeated tearfully. I hate him. I hate him. Now it was Matthew who was comforting her, stroking her hand. But the girl couldn't come down. The monstrous injustice that had befallen her husband wouldn't let her rest. Matt eventually visited his friend a few days later when they transferred him to a regular room. He seemed somewhat subdued. How are you? Matt cautiously inquired. Getting better. Thank you, by the way, for your help. I never got the chance to thank you properly, Matthew said. My mother-in-law was pleased with the repairs, and she says it feels much fresher here now. We were so worried, Jennifer added sardonically. We couldn't sleep at night, thinking about your mother-in-law. Matt blushed but chose to pretend he hadn't heard her remark. Matthew gave his wife a reproachful look and said, I'm feeling a bit better, actually. The excruciating pain from the first few days has subsided. How about you? Did you get off lightly? I'm fine, Matt smirked. But from the looks of it, you're all covered in casts. What are the doctors saying about when you'll be able to stand on your feet again? Jennifer's patience snapped. She jumped up from her chair and pushed the annoying visitor out the door. Matthew shouted something after her, but she didn't hear him. She closed the door behind her and looked at Matt, who had shrunk under her gaze. Why did you come? Jennifer asked furiously. To gloat over us, didn't you? Well, did you get a good look at your friend? Now you probably feel relieved that it's not you in his place. I came for a regular friendly visit, Matt declared, defended. What's so special about that? Are you even asking? Jennifer protested. A regular friendly visit? Huh, you've practically shattered Matthew's whole life, and I don't even know what's going to happen to him now. Is your conscience clear now? Have you fulfilled your friendly duty? Just go away. Is it really that serious? The man stammered. Just go. Jennifer shouted. Matt left, constantly looking back, 
as if afraid Jennifer might throw something at him. Jennifer tried to calm down and returned to the room. Why did you send him away? Matthew asked inquisitively. He came to talk. What's going on with you? I'm sorry, I don't even know. Jennifer mumbled. After that accident, I'm not myself. I'm on edge all the time. Can't seem to calm down. Matthew's gaze softened and he potted the edge of his bed, saying, I'm sure Matt understands everything. Let's just sit here for a while. Let's not talk about him right now. Sitting together was the remnants of happiness Jennifer could count on. Soon, even that would end when her husband learned the truth. You know, I think after I'm discharged, I'll have to quit my job at the factory. Matthew unexpectedly said, War. Jennifer asked, surprised. I've given too much time to that job, and life passed me by. Matthew replied, After events like this accident, you realize things more clearly. You can't postpone anything. We'll use the money I saved for the car. Then, when everything settles, we'll save more, and we'll spend all that on a trip. Where would you like to go? Maybe to the mountains, Mount Elbrus or the Alps. Do you think it'll be enough? Or perhaps a seaside destination? Something exotic, like India, for example. I've had all these plans while lying here. There's nothing to do, so I can only plan. Jennifer involuntarily covered her face with her hands, barely holding back tears. How late Matthew was with his plans. A whole lifetime late. What's wrong? Matthew asked, surprised. Do you think I won't be able to? Jennifer replied, but I really am feeling better. I can feel it. With fractures, there's nothing we can do except wait for time to heal them. But all the other pains are gradually fading, and my legs don't hurt at all. If you think about it, they didn't hurt at all after the accident, although the doctor said there were some complex fractures. Strange, isn't it? She fell silent. She couldn't come up with a single topic to steer the conversation away, and nothing came to mind. Matthew's face took on a puzzled expression. I can't feel them at all, he repeated, looking at Jennifer. I can't feel my legs, he said louder. What does that mean? Jennifer didn't need to respond. Matthew read the answer in her eyes. It was then that Jennifer saw him cry for the first time. Her husband was discharged from the hospital two months later. Thin, unshaven, Matthew hardly resembled himself. Jennifer felt like she was going home with a completely different person. Elle should be waiting for us by the entrance, Jennifer said in an overly cheerful tone, and her husband. They had promised to come to visit us. What a joy, Matthew mumbled. I wonder what they're planning to celebrate. What do you mean, what? Jennifer replied. Your discharge, of course. Matthew raised an eyebrow with irony. Seriously, discharge, do you think I'll ever be discharged from this body? Jennifer understood. He meant that he was now permanently locked in this body. I won't even go back to the factory now, Matthew said bitterly as they packed up their things from the hospital. Be careful what you wish for, they say. I wanted to avoid work, there you go. Now I'm permanently unemployed. Your hands still work beautifully, Jennifer retorted. I'm sure you can find a job you love. Yeah, like what? Matthew inquired. You know I'm not a programmer. What kind of job can I find to earn money without leaving the house? Making bracelets for schoolgirls. They'll be a big hit, I have no doubt. All of Jennifer's attempts to lift his spirits even a little ended in vain. Matthew's gloomy mood seemed impenetrable. Here we are, Elle exclaimed joyfully as the taxi pulled up to the house, and not alone, but with a gift. Look here. Her husband, Thomas, demonstrated a wheelchair to the couple. Matthew glanced at it and muttered, what a splendid gift. I've dreamt of it all my life. Did someone give you a hint? Elle and Thomas exchanged confused glances. They clearly didn't know how to react to this outburst. Jennifer hesitantly said, I'll help you get into it. I can manage myself. Matthew replied with an unusual irritation. You won't have the strength for that, Jennifer insisted. He attempted to transfer from the car to the wheelchair, but it turned out that during his time in the hospital, Matthew's hands had weakened. He nearly fell to the ground and was rescued by Thomas, who helped him settle into the seat. Then Matthew was wheeled up to the second floor. The whole procession entered the apartment, maintaining a solemn silence. Just as they found themselves in their own place, Matthew said, I'm sorry, but there won't be any celebration today. Maybe some other time. Yes, of course, we understand, Elle replied hastily. 
Let's go, Thomas. We'll visit another time. Over the next few years, they never came back. However, Jennifer didn't expect anything else. After the guests left, he went to bed and didn't get up for the rest of the day. Aren't you tired of being in the hospital? Jennifer cautiously asked. What else can I do? Matthew replied, I don't have much of a choice, either lying down or sitting. In my dreams, at least, I see different places, but otherwise, it's just these walls and the courtyard outside the window. In the following days, and then years, Jennifer became more and more convinced that her husband had been replaced. Matthew was hardly interested in anything. He would go hours without uttering a word, staring out of the window with a vacant look, lost in his thoughts. Sometimes, he would chat with someone online. It turned out later that he was talking to other disabled individuals, and these conversations made Matthew even gloomier. His online companions complained about their fates, shared their stories, and all in unison told him that it was all over. That's not true at all, Jennifer protested. Yes, they couldn't help you in our town, but there's no need to despair. We'll go to the capital and seek help there, I promise you. We'll surely come up with something. Look at what I've become, though, he said. I look like a homeless person. Who's waiting for me out there? That's because you rarely shave, she pointed out. If you looked in the mirror more often, then I'd see more nightmares, Matthew finished for her. Don't try. I already know I've turned into a nobody. I'm just a burden on your life. Look at yourself, dark circles under your eyes, barely making ends meet, and I can't help you with anything. I'm not a man. Jennifer shook her head. Don't say that. Isn't it the truth? He asked and unexpectedly added, put me in a shelter for the disabled. It must be easier than knocking on professor's doors, and it would be easier for you. You'll breathe a sigh of relief right away. Idiot. Jennifer muttered. I don't even want to talk about such nonsense. The girl went to the kitchen to prepare lunch, and the man shouted after her. Don't you want to talk? At least think about it. Like what? Jennifer mumbled, but Matthew's words lodged in her memory like a splinter. What left a stronger impression was the expression on her husband's face when he uttered those words wild, almost fanatical, as if he would have checked himself into a shelter if he could. For a moment, I thought he was going insane. Jennifer later confessed to her friend, and then I thought maybe I was going crazy. Anyone in Matthew's place would have fallen into depression, I'll tactfully pointed out. Have you considered showing him to a psychologist? He doesn't want to, Jennifer replied. He says that his body might be disabled, but his mind is perfectly fine, though I have my doubts. Sometimes I feel like there's no soul left in him, just an empty gaze, complete prostration. But at times, he seems quite normal, makes plans for the household, and I don't understand anything. Yeah, El said thoughtfully, paused for a moment, and added, maybe he's right. Maybe it would be better that way. What's better? Jennifer didn't understand. Maybe you should consider getting a divorce and living separately, El cautiously suggested. In a care facility, Matthew would be among his own kind, and he'd receive proper care, with doctors always nearby. What are you talking about, El? Jennifer shouted. Have you forgotten that I'm a doctor myself? And what do you mean his own kind? Is Matthew some lunatic or in the Enderfall? He's just as human as you and me. You know what I mean. Her friend sighed. Jennifer, no offense, but it's just painful to watch you. I think Matthew is right. With all these responsibilities, you're just digging your own grave, like the wives in ancient India. When their husbands died, they went to the funeral pyre with them. Matthew is alive. Jennifer stubbornly declared, and I won't abandon him, no matter what you all say or think about me. However, despite all these words, she understood that her strength was waning. She didn't want to leave Matthew, but she didn't know how long her strength would last. A year, two, and then she would break down, go crazy or get sick from the stress. She couldn't cry at home in front of her husband, so Jennifer had gotten used to doing it at work. She locked herself in her office when the nurse Maggie went for lunch and shed tears in the restroom. What a hysterical woman, Jennifer bitterly thought, but there was nothing she could do. Turning into a stone lady and forever drying her eyes was beyond her capabilities. Her mood that morning couldn't have been worse, and Matthew worsened it further by rolling his wheelchair into the kitchen just as she was cooking at the stove. 
What's the point of all this? Her husband asked darkly. You could have slept for an extra hour instead of messing around with the meat. I didn't have time last night, Jennifer replied meekly. And you can't skip lunch, can you? I'll order some instant noodles from the store, Matthew replied. Deliveries available. Noodles, seriously. Have you read the ingredients? It's all flavor enhancers and preservatives. Nothing can harm me anymore, her husband said. You could even poison me, just end my suffering. Stop talking like that, Jennifer cried. I can't stand it. It's the same thing every day. She threw a pot holder on the table, squatted down, and cried aloud. Her husband was taken aback by this. Forgive me, he muttered, but you know it's true. I don't need any food. Just live your life. You're such a whiner and a pessimist, Jennifer finally murmured. It's disgusting to watch. She got up, turned off the stove, and headed for the hallway. She was in a hurry to leave this apartment as quickly as possible and avoid Matthew's guilty eyes. However, the feelings in her heart didn't disappear. They continued to rage, even when she arrived at work. Jennifer, your eyes are red, cardiologist David remarked when he met her in the corridor. Is something wrong? I had an unbearable patient. Jennifer mumbled. Don't mind me, everything's fine. Jennifer wanted to leave, but the next words from the man stopped her. Why are you lying? David said, I know about the tragedy in your family. The whole hospital is aware. So why ask if you already know everything? Jennifer snapped, then immediately shook her head. I'm sorry, David. I don't know what's gotten into me. My nerves are completely shot. I have problems at home. It's all right. I know how it can be. David reassured her. I'm sorry for intruding. I just wanted to know if you needed any help. Jennifer shook her head. What help could there be? Thank you. I'll manage somehow. Nevertheless, if you ever want to talk, I'm always here for you. The man continued. And joking aside, sometimes people need to vent. You can't keep everything inside. I know that all too well. I lost my wife a couple of years ago. Jennifer looked at the man in surprise. David always smiled, looked lively, and seemed unshakable. It appeared that nothing could throw him off balance. How does he keep it together? Unlike me, Jennifer thought, my Matthew is alive, and here I am, shedding tears like a crybaby. Well, if you ever want to talk about heart issues, you know where to find me. David nodded. I'll leave you to it, and here's something to sweeten the rest of your day. And remember to smile, even occasionally, you'll see. Your husband will appreciate it too. He walked into his office, leaving Jennifer staring at the piece of candy that remained in her hand. Jennifer hadn't received candy from her husband in a hundred years. In fact, she hadn't received any from anyone else either, except once from Lisa, who had been very pleased with the treatment Jennifer had prescribed. Back then, it was a chocolate bar, and now Jennifer was looking at the tiny piece of candy in her hand, smiling to herself without knowing why. A kind gesture from a relatively unfamiliar person had lifted her spirits a bit, but it didn't tend there. By the time it was time for Jennifer to return home, it had started raining suddenly, a downpour without warning. Within half an hour, a cloud had replaced the clear sky and a thunderstorm began. Thunder and lightning followed each other without respite. Light show, an old lady standing on the porch next to Jennifer shook her head. I've never seen anything like it. Jennifer agreed with her words. Behind the torrents of water pouring from the sky, it was hard to make out the opposite side of the street, let alone the bus stop. She took her phone out of her bag, intending to call a taxi, but immediately put it back. The plan was doomed to fail in this weather. There was no way to get a taxi, and if anyone did agree to come, it would be for an exorbitant fee. Jennifer and Matthew had already tightened their belts in recent years. Saving was necessary. A car suddenly braked. Jennifer heard a familiar voice. Need a ride? She looked at the person who spoke. David was sitting in the driver's seat, looking at her. Do you not want it? Jennifer hesitated. The storm will calm down a bit, and I can go to the bus stop. No buses. David protested. You're already soaked. You need to go home and have some tea. Get in quickly. Jennifer made up her mind, jumped into the front seat, and closed the door. Only in the warmth of the car did she realize how cold she was. The cardiologist was right. At this rate, she could actually catch bronchitis. The last thing she needed was another sick person at home, on top of Matthew. 
David stopped the car near some kiosk and got out. Jennifer thought he had gone to buy cigarettes, but she was mistaken. When he returned, the cardiologist handed her a small cup. Coffee, drink up, you're freezing, he said. Thank you, Jennifer mumbled. You've been taking care of me so much today. It's almost embarrassing. It should be me who's embarrassed, not you, he replied. I saw that things weren't right with you but couldn't bring myself to approach you. You really didn't have to, Jennifer began, but David interrupted her. I had to, he insisted. I'm a specialist in matters of the heart. Have you forgotten, and you carry a heavy burden in your heart? It's plain to see, so spill your symptoms. Tell me what's going on. The girl was initially taken aback by such a sudden outpouring but then realized that she could no longer keep silent. It's all because of my husband's illness, Matthew. She mumbled. You've probably heard that he's disabled, can't get up from his chair. It's been two years already, and things aren't getting better. He can't find work, and his favorite activities are out of the question, which leaves us both frustrated. It feels like we're going to end up hating each other. It's a common thing. David nodded but you don't hate each other. You're frustrated with the situation you've found yourselves in. The hardships life has thrown your way, and that's what's tormenting you. I don't know what to do, Jennifer muttered. Maybe there's nothing more to be done, and the best solution is a divorce, the cardiologist suggested. What? Jennifer shook her head. Can I just leave Matthew all alone? Doesn't he have any parents or other relatives? The doctor inquired. No, his parents passed away. And as for other relatives, Matthew hardly ever talked to them. They are complete strangers and live in a different city. David remained silent, his gaze fixed on the road. Jennifer suddenly felt an unwavering trust in him. It seemed like this person had answers to all the questions. So she repeated, so, what should I do? Live, the man simply said. Try not to dissolve completely in your sorrow, you know. When I saw your sad eyes today, I thought it had almost happened. David dropped her off in front of her building and smiled as he said goodbye. Remember, my ears are always at your disposal, he said. If you ever want to vent or shed a tear, come to my office. Jennifer smiled back, a bit embarrassed. Then I'll probably become a nuisance. That won't happen, the cardiologist reassured her and drove away. Jennifer watched the car for a moment and then put her hand in her pocket. She never ate the gifted piece of candy. She kept it as a talisman. What a silly thing to do. Matthew met her in the hallway. After the morning incident, he looked somewhat guilty, kept his gaze mostly on the floor, and spoke softly, as if afraid Jennifer would have another fit. I made macaroni and cheese. And how did it turn out? Jennifer asked. Matthew shook his head. Total failure. You're better off not seeing it. But I'll learn. He assured her. It's high time to relieve you of at least this job. I can handle it, she assured him. Please don't overexert yourself. Fortunately, he didn't start another argument. He just asked, who gave you a ride? A taxi driver. Jennifer inexplicably lied. The weather took a turn for the worse, so I decided not to get wet. She didn't even know why she had told that lie. She didn't want to reveal the identity of David, this kind-hearted genius, for some reason. So... It's the taxi driver you were smiling so nicely at. Matthew mumbled thoughtfully. What? Jennifer asked in alarm. She was sure she must have misheard. Nothing. The man sighed. Let's have dinner. I'll make some tea now. Jennifer firmly believed that this would be the end of her interaction with David. What could they possibly have in common? What man had a reason to listen to her complaints? Jennifer had no intention of continuing to pour her heart out to him. However, a couple of days later, the cardiologist approached her in the hallway and handed her a small bouquet of flowers. I wanted to brighten your day a little, David said, and liven up the office for a day at least, so here you go. Jennifer shook her head desperately. Thank you, but it's not necessary, she said, and even hid her hands behind her back. There's no special occasion today, and how do I explain this to people? Is it necessary to explain receiving flowers to anyone? The cardiologist wondered, do you always have to justify yourself? Mechanically, Jennifer took the flowers and watched him with rise. Her emotions were in turmoil. Wow, flowers. Who are they from? The nurse asked when Jennifer returned to the office. A patient gave them. Jennifer lied again. Ian Stork, 
Remember the one who came in with tonsillitis. It was so unexpected. I agree, Maddie muttered. Jennifer felt very awkward. She had told a lie about David for the second time and had no idea why she did that. The flowers sat on the windowsill until the end of the day, and occasionally, when the nurse left the office, Jennifer would inhale their fragrance with delight. On her way home, Jennifer left them on a bench in the park. She couldn't bring herself to throw away such beauty in the trash, but she didn't want to explain it to Matthew. She didn't want to lie to her husband for the third time. Jennifer lost count of how many times she had lied to Matthew. Jennifer, did you hear that a new comedy came out last weekend? David asked Jennifer some time later. They say it's a great movie. Would you like to go see it? Jennifer was taken aback by such an offer. David, actually, I'm married, she muttered. And so what? The cardiologist asked. It's just a movie, a friendly trip to the cinema. You need to relax a bit, I can see that and it'll only take a couple of hours. I'll drive you home after the show. I don't even know. Jennifer mumbled. It seemed like she hadn't been to the movies in a hundred years. She couldn't recall when or with whom she had last been to a movie theater. She remembered the dimly lit theater, the enticing smell of popcorn, which now, after all this time, seemed tempting to her. Without realizing it, she said, yes. Jennifer had lied to Matthew about something involving a subtly ill acquaintance an elderly lady named Lisa. Lisa had unknowingly become Jennifer's constant alibi. When Jennifer was about to go somewhere with the cardiologist, she would refer to Lisa. Lisa had heart trouble. Her blood pressure spiked. She had been poisoned by something. A simple visit to the movies, dinner at a cafe, an evening at the theater. Jennifer didn't even notice that even kisses with David had become commonplace. She realized that she was acting very unfairly towards Matthew, but she couldn't help herself. She promised herself she would end it, but she broke that promise immediately. Her apartment was silent and dark, while with David, it was always fun. Matthew never asked where she disappeared to, and that bothered Jennifer the most. She didn't want to make her relationship with the cardiologist public knowledge, but this indifference was killing her. Jennifer soon began to notice that the nurse, Maggie, was looking at her strangely. The two women didn't often talk to each other, and Maggie's questions were infrequent but piercing. Where did you get that sweater? She asked, examining Jennifer's new sweater. Matthew will probably like it, or maybe not just him. Or she could be even more direct. I went to the movies yesterday to see a new film, and the main character spent the entire two hours cheating on her husband with different men. Disgusting. What's your take on cheaters? But the worst part was when Jennifer's mother found out about David. She had seen them behind the window of some cafe, and during their next meeting, she began to interrogate her daughter. Who was that man? She asked demandingly. Who are you going to cafes with in the evenings? You mean David? Jennifer asked, bewildered. He's my colleague. He works at the same clinic as I do. A doctor, then, Courtney said with satisfaction. Jennifer realized too late that presenting her as married to a medical professional had always been a fixed idea for her mother. And what's between you two? Courtney asked. Nothing. We're just friends. Jennifer blushed in response. Why are you asking such questions, mom? Friends, Courtney snorted. Your father never looked at me that way, even though he wasn't just an ordinary friend. Who are you fooling, darling? I perfectly understand what's going on here. Jennifer fell into embarrassed silence as Courtney spoke bluntly. You and Matthew need to get a divorce. What are you saying, Mom? The young woman protested. How can I leave him? I'm not suggesting you abandon him completely. Her mother shrugged. You could find a care facility or someplace they send people like him who have no relatives. Enough. Jennifer shouted. I don't want to hear about this. Courtney sighed heavily. You're still too young. But someday you'll understand that I was right. The main thing is that it won't be too late by then. A good man is pursuing you. Give him a chance, and you'll have a future with him. That day, Jennifer returned home irritated. Matthew noticed her mood and broke his perpetual silence. Something's not right, he inquired. Did something happen? Everything's fine, Jennifer muttered. You must be imagining things. It's probably me, Matthew mused. And Jennifer didn't argue with him because it was the truth. Everything good and bad in her life was connected to Matthew. 
Kearney no longer broached the subject of divorce, and Jennifer was grateful for that. Matthew had returned to his usual silence, but something still troubled Jennifer. Something wouldn't let her be at ease. That's why she declined David's invitation to go to a restaurant. She returned home just in time to hear her husband ask his friend to bring a shotgun from his grandfather's house. It's time to finish her off. Did Matthew really mean her, Jennifer? When he said those words, eh, her husband ended the call, placed the phone on the windowsill, and continued to gaze out the window. His gaze didn't immediately catch Jennifer's reflection in the glass. For a brief moment, neither of them spoke. Then he noticed, you're back early. Jennifer nodded, and Matthew continued in confusion. It seemed like you were going somewhere today. Everything fell through, Jennifer replied. I came back home. Disappointing, Matthew muttered. What exactly? Jennifer dared to ask, is it disappointing that I overheard your conversation with Matt, or that Lisa miraculously recovered, and I came back home? Is it disappointing that your perfect evening fell apart? You weren't going to visit a patient, were you? Jennifer nodded again, then finally mustered the courage to ask, how long have you known? Probably just a month. Before that, I only had suspicions, Matthew replied. Where did you find out? Jennifer inquired, your friend told me, or maybe I shouldn't call her that, he responded. L. Jennifer asked, hardly believing her ears. She had spoken with her friend about David before, and while L didn't exactly approve, she didn't condemn their affair either. They had dropped the subject at that time, and now, this shocking news. Why L? Matthew asked in surprise. Maggie, she came to my house one day, opened my eyes, told me you both work together, that the whole hospital, almost the entire town, knows, and I was the only one in the dark. Jennifer slumped against the door frame, feeling the full weight of the shame she had been experiencing but was afraid to admit. She couldn't imagine looking her husband in the eyes, and Matthew's strangely calm demeanor was unsettling. She could have assumed he didn't care at all. After composing herself somewhat, Jennifer asked, So, what now? Do you want to kill me? Matthew stared at her in bewilderment for a moment and then burst into unexpected laughter. Kill you? No, of course not, Jennifer. How did you even think of that? But why? Jennifer said weakly, all this talk about the shotgun, what's it for? Upon hearing this, Matthew stopped laughing immediately and withdrew into himself. You must have imagined it, he muttered. It's not true, Jennifer counted. I heard you clearly asking Matt to bring the shotgun. Why do you need it? Do you want to shoot birds from the window? I won't believe that for a moment. You've never harmed animals. So, it turns out, you think I've harmed you. Her husband grimly smirked. And I don't. That's what I can't understand. Jennifer said. Just don't dwell on it, that's all. Matthew requested. Everything will be fine. Fine for whom? Jennifer pressed. For you. Primarily for me. Matthew mumbled. Jennifer stared at him for a while, and then a terrible guess crept into her head. You were going to shoot yourself, weren't you? She whispered. I don't believe it. You're not that crazy, Matthew. Say something because her husband remained silent and stubbornly averted his gaze. Jennifer realized her words were true. I can't believe it, she repeated. How could you think of such a thing, Matthew? How could you? What's wrong with it? It's better for everyone, you and me and this David. Jennifer stared at him in silence, struck by the pain she heard in Matthew's voice. He finally looked up at her and repeated, it's what's best for you, trust me. What makes you think you know better than me about what I need? exploded Jennifer. Because it's obvious enough, Matthew replied, you need a normal man to go to the movies with, a restaurant, wherever else you go. Go on vacation at the end of the day. Not a cripple you'll be looking after for the rest of your life and cooking his meals. You have to live, Jennifer, and it's time for me to die. Why do you want that so badly? whispered Jennifer. Because I'm tired, Matthew replied. This David of yours, in fact, I'm hardly mad at him at all. It's even good to have that type in your life. You'll have someone to leave you to, and I'm tired of feeling the pain of this trauma. Gritting my teeth and having to endure not waking you up at night or swallowing handfuls of painkillers. You didn't tell me you had any pain. Jennifer blustered. Not a word, no matter how many times I asked. Why would you have told me you had enough problems with me as it was? I didn't want to bring this one on top of that. What about the professor we wanted to go to? 
We were planning on saving up enough money and signing up for his surgery, remember, said Jennifer in a weak voice. Matthew smiled sadly in response to her words. Save those fairy tales for little children, he asked. I grew out of them long ago. They were silent for a while, and then Jennifer wiped away the tears that had come to her eyes and said firmly, I'm not letting Matt anywhere near our house. Let them try to come and bring their gun. I will shoot him myself, do you understand? Matthew stared at her in amazement. She didn't wait for an answer, turned around and went to the bathroom to wash up. Her soul was churning with anger at Matthew, at his body, and the biggest one at herself. She didn't have a plan yet, but Jennifer realized it was time to act. The time for restaurants and idle fun was over. The next day, the girl called the clinic and said she wouldn't be coming. She said she had a sudden cold. The supervisor was not pleased, but Jennifer didn't care. She had more important things to worry about. You should have gone to work, Matthew said quietly. I texted Matt and canceled my request. He won't be coming in today, so he'll show up tomorrow, the girl asked, not taking her eyes off the window. Good, then I'll take a week's sick leave, a month if I have to. Quit altogether if I have to. Don't talk nonsense, Matthew burst out. Have you decided to completely ruin your life for me? Is there a problem with that? You're the one who decided to walk away just to make my life easier. What's a job compared to that? Matthew was swearing, but Jennifer was only glad for this outburst. For many months, her husband had looked as alive and full of energy as he did now, in the heat of his anger, ready to wreak havoc in their apartment. He raged for a while, and the young woman watched him calmly. Then they both fell into silence and settled by the window. Their fragile world had been restored. Hours passed as the couple observed the happenings in the courtyard, watching grandmothers hurrying home from the store and birds flying by. Jennifer unexpectedly realized that she hadn't felt this easy and peaceful in a long time. She was almost happy, almost, because she still couldn't bring herself to take Matthew's hand. She was afraid he would react negatively to the gesture and erupt in anger again. Somewhere on the edge of Jennifer's consciousness, a thought kept nagging at her. Perhaps, deep down, her husband wanted the same thing. It was already getting dark outside when Matthew suddenly broke the silence. He's here, he muttered unfriendly. Who? Jennifer didn't understand. Matthew silently pointed to the car parked below their window. The young woman looked at it and recognized David's car. What does he need here? Jennifer wondered aloud. Jennifer's phone began to ring. Go to him, Matthew said. He traveled all this way to see you. So, you knew everything. You saw us together, Jennifer asked. Of course, I saw. I may not be walking, but my eyes work just fine, Matthew replied. The phone continued to ring, and Matthew urged his wife. Go on, why are you sitting here? But Jennifer continued to sit. Matthew threatened her. If you don't go right now, I'll open the window and call him up here. Do you think it's okay? Jennifer blushed as she asked, Is it normal to just send your wife to her lover like this? Matthew Sidley smiled. I just want you to be happy. You know that. Jennifer stood up with a determined look and nodded. All right, I'll go. But only for five minutes. And don't even think about doing anything during that time. Got it. She warned. Matthew obediently nodded. Yes, my commander. Before heading out the door, Jennifer grabbed a kitchen knife, just in case. She wasn't entirely sure that Matthew would back down from his idea and not seek an alternative to the gun. Her husband noticed her move and chuckled behind Jennifer, but at least it lightened his mood for once. She approached the car and asked in a stern tone, Why did you come? David tore his gaze away from his phone and looked at her. So, you saw me? He asked. I was worried about your health. Just yesterday, you were complaining about not feeling well, and today, you didn't go to work, so I decided to check on you. You weren't the only one who saw me, Jennifer said grimly. Your husband did too, I suppose. I'm sorry. I didn't think about that, David admitted reluctantly. That's what I thought, Jennifer slyly remarked. You always used to drop me off almost a kilometer away from the building, and today, you pulled up right to the door. Were you intentionally trying to let Matthew find out about everything, hoping that we'd get a divorce? David nodded hesitantly. Yes, deep down, that was my wish. This can't go on forever. Cafes, 
theaters are we teenagers sneaking around behind our parents' backs. We need to figure everything out once and for all. We have to discuss everything like adults. We've already figured it out. Jennifer replied, I'm sorry, David, but I can't stay with you. David looked at her in surprise. Did you tell Matthew about everything? There was no need. Jennifer answered. Others told him. And what? The cardiologist asked cautiously. Is he threatening you? Giving ultimatums? Playing on your sympathy? Jennifer shook her head. No, it's much worse than that. Matthew wanted to kill himself, with the best of intentions, to relieve me of my burden, so to speak. Are you sure this isn't just idle chatter? You know how sick people often make up things like that to get her tension. I'm sure, said the girl. I found out about it by accident. Overheard Matthew on the phone with a buddy. David rubbed his temples and closed his eyes for a moment. He looked exhausted. And what will you do now? Continue living in this hell without the possibility of early release? He asked. No, Jennifer replied. I will do everything in my power to help Matthew get back on his feet. I'll launch a full-scale campaign, so to speak. It's long past time to take action, rather than just saving money and thinking about the future. David remained silent for a while and then said, I'll try to help you, both you and Matthew. Wait a few days. I'll gather some information. What can you do? Jennifer wondered, David, do you have some connections in the capital? It's not certain yet. The man vaguely replied, I need to find out some things. Jennifer, I wish you patience. I've learned to be patient over these years. Jennifer nodded. David's car drove away, and Jennifer watched it go before returning home. What's new with you? Matthew asked as soon as she stepped into the apartment. There was no doubt he had been watching their meeting through the window. We broke up. Jennifer replied. Matthew stared at her as if she had uttered blasphemy. Have you gone crazy? He asked. A decent man, a doctor. He offered you his hand and heart, and you rejected him. Firstly, he didn't get a chance to offer anything, Jennifer responded, and secondly, I realized that I don't love him, he's a crazy invalid with suicidal tendencies, I prefer you, are you satisfied? I don't even know, Matthew mumbled, honestly, it's a big surprise to me that in my condition, I managed to win back my wife from someone else. Jennifer suddenly burst into tears and pressed his head against her chest, forgive me, she whispered, please. Forgive me for everything. We will fight and we will definitely win. I will get you back on your feet, do you hear me? It seemed that Matthew had shed some tears too. Jennifer made a promise to herself that this would be the last time they cried. They would laugh together in the future. The past would be forgotten like a bad dream. It would happen, for sure. A week later, David invited her to his office. Jennifer was afraid he might bring up the topic of divorce again, but he said, Don't worry. I won't repeat our previous conversation, it's about something else. It seems I might be able to arrange a meeting for you with a renowned professor. How? Jennifer wondered in amazement. Are you a magician? Not me, my ex-wife, David reluctantly admitted, then added, former ex-wife. Wife. Jennifer was surprised, but you told me she had passed away. I said I lost her. Jennifer corrected David. There's a big difference. She left me and went to conquer the capital. She's a doctor too, much more ambitious and daring than I am. You never told me that. Jennifer noted with a hint of resentment. Who wants to talk about being abandoned by their wife? The man grumbled. It's rather humiliating. Most importantly, when we divorced, she called me a complete egotist, claiming I was self-absorbed and only cared about myself. It was a big surprise to her when I asked for her help for your husband. Does she know this professor? Jennifer asked for clarification. She knows half of Spain. The man sighed. Anyway, you should start getting ready to go. If he can't help you, then I don't know what to do. Jennifer stared at him in astonishment for a few moments, then stood up and planted a firm kiss on his cheek. For the last time, and purely as friends, she said, David, thank you for everything. If only you knew how much this means to me. Jennifer didn't believe until the very end that the miracle would actually happen. And when she met David's former wife in the capital, an impressive blind who looked more like a fashion model than a doctor, and when she met the professor, and even after the surgery, when her husband lay in a regular hospital room, she couldn't believe it was all real. You know what's the strangest part? Jennifer said, 
All these years, while we were saving up for the surgery, we were thinking about meeting the professor. I dreamed of coming here, but now, I want to go back home as soon as possible. I'm silly, aren't I? In that case, I'm silly too, because I think the same way, Matthew replied. What a long journey we still have ahead of us, right? Jennifer said sadly. Journey, Matthew repeated thoughtfully. I like that word. And yet the girl was right. When she returned home, her husband faced a long rehabilitation process in the local hospitals. Overcoming pain and tension in his weakened muscles, Matthew learned to walk again. How are the progress today? Jennifer would invariably ask every evening. Will we be running races together soon? Are you mocking me? Matthew chuckled. Just wait. Once I'm back on my feet, I'll show you. In the beginning, I'll be holding your hand. The girl promised. I'll teach you to walk again, just like you taught me to swim. You're quite the joker. Jennifer shook her head. Her phone, lying at the edge of the table, rang. The spouses exchanged worried glances. Jennifer answered, yes. Matthew couldn't hear a word, but his wife's face quickly darkened. I'll be there soon. She promised and got up, leaving her unfinished soup on the table. Where are you going? Matthew asked. I need to go. I'll check on Lisa. The girl replied absent-mindedly. Lisa isn't feeling well. And if you're worried about David, well, I don't think there's much of a secret there. I can tell you everything. He is reconciled with his wife again and is leaving for Madrid. They helped us, can you imagine? Good luck, Matthew said in a subdued voice. I won't go to sleep until you're back. Jennifer kissed him and rushed to the door. Everything would be fine now. Life was getting back on track. Here we are. Elle stepped into the hallway, flashing a Hollywood smile. She still looked young and slim, despite having a child. Her little son, Michael, clung to her hand, glancing shyly at Jennifer. Come in, come in. Jennifer exclaimed joyfully. Where's Thomas? Hasn't he come? Why wouldn't he come? He's parking the car in the yard, Elle replied. With so many cars here, it's hard to get through. Soon, her husband did indeed enter the apartment. Matthew stepped out of the room to greet the couple, and they stared at him in silent astonishment. What? Matthew asked, feeling embarrassed. Why are you all looking at me like that? You're walking. My goodness, I can't believe it. What a miracle. Elle exclaimed joyfully and hugged him tightly. Jennifer smiled at her husband and friend. Let's pretend we didn't see that, she said. Elle was always so unrestrained, whether in sorrow or joy. Soon, I'll start feeling jealous of her own husband. I'm used to it, Thomas nodded. Matthew struggled to peel Elle away from him. She had been tearfully hugging his shoulders and said, Well, well, calm down. Look at your husband. If you don't stop now, he might break my legs again, and I can't bear that a second time. Wiping away her tears, Elle backed away. I apologize, she said. It's just all so unexpected. I'm very happy for you. You and Jennifer deserve this happiness. They were about to go into the living room when the doorbell rang again. Everyone exchanged puzzled glances. Who could it be? Matthew asked, his voice thinly veiling his jealousy. Could it be David? Jennifer replied, don't be silly. David moved to the capital three months ago. Why would he come back? A distinguished middle-aged man in a business suit with a neatly trimmed beard, bearing a resemblance to Chekhov, stood behind the door. Good day, he said slightly nervously, looking at Elle. Are you Jennifer? That's her, Elle replied, pointing at Jennifer. The man nodded and shifted his gaze to Jennifer. It's a pleasure to meet you, he said. I'm Lisa's son, her son. Jennifer was taken aback. Lisa never mentioned having relatives. No wonder, the man sighed sadly. We've seen each other once every five years, thanks to my work. How is she? Jennifer asked. Is Lisa doing better? Better is an understatement, he said. She's as lively as a butterfly, you could say. You saved her from the worst. The doctor who's currently attending to her said the risk of a heart attack was very high. That's why I came here. I wanted to thank you for your help. This is for you. He handed Jennifer a plump envelope, but she shook her head. You don't need to thank me, she said. That evening, I rushed to help not for money. Please, take it anyway. The man insisted. I'm doing this from the bottom of my heart. I'm asking you. Jennifer accepted the envelope, and the stranger left. Elle flicked through the bills with her finger and whistled. So, 
You and Matthew are well off now. Are you thinking of studying medicine too? Maybe become a nurse. It's a gold mine. What are you going to do with all this money? The spouses exchanged glances. I remember in another life you used to dream of becoming an artist, Matthew remarked, and you wanted to lead people on hikes, Jennifer recalled. Hikes are out of the question for now, Matthew sighed. I'm still getting around with a cane. You'll learn, Jennifer assured him. With our son by your side, you'll be guiding each other, and who knows, maybe you'll even go to the mountains. With our son, Matthew asked, surprised. Jennifer nodded and placed her hand on her stomach. Her husband dropped his cane and embraced her. Hold on to them, hold on. Elle shouted to her husband. Make sure they don't fall. I'll never fall again, Matthew assured everyone, his eyes shining as he looked at his wife. We won't fall, Jennifer corrected him. We'll always be together.